Dear colleagues, it's my honor to welcome you to the 14th Annual Pervasive Health Conference. According to Wikipedia, the traditional gift for one's 14th anniversary is ivory, and the modern gift is gold. It turns out that these are very appropriate since, broadly speaking, these are Georgia Tech's colors. Go Jackets. All kidding aside, ivory and gold are also appropriate because in my estimation, they stand for the values we have at Pervasive Health and also in our scholarship. Ivory as the ivory tower standing for our ideals to be true to scholarly values and gold as the gold standard by which we can move science, health and design forward for the betterment of society. When I was asked to be general chair, I never, expe I never expected that our world would take the turn that it did. All I knew was that I wanted to find the strongest organizing committee possible. The bedrock of any scholarly conference are the technical program chairs, and I was lucky enough to have Sean Munson and Stephen Schuller agree to take on this commitment and join me on this journey. I also enlisted the help of other colleagues who have interacted with us during the poster presentations, workshops, and other activities. We also had the tireless work of Carolina Markinkova from EAI. In these days of uncertainty, opportunities such as this conference allow us to feel connected instead of isolated, provide us with a sense of shared purpose despite the distance between us, and fill us with hope that we will get through it together and that we will see each other in person sometime. Now I want to send, um, I want to have uh, our program chairs, Sean Munson and Steve Schiller, uh, take us through what's going to happen in the conference. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. We're very much looking forward to our program over the next few days, but we first want to recognize the authors and reviewers who helped us get here. On the full papers track, we received 60 submissions. These papers were reviewed by our program committee, including 51 program committee members who reviewed each paper, nine senior program committee members who prepared meta reviews and worked with Stephen and me to ensure consistency across reviews. If we were all together in Atlanta right now, this is the part where we'd ask those program committee members to stand up and we'd all applause. Let's just take a moment and think of those program committee members and we're applauding you right now. In this format, I also really want to emphasize how lucky we were to be able to work with this incredibly talented group. Uh, they demonstrated a lot of care and, and just passion for, for supporting good research and getting that work out there. We also thank the authors for sharing this work with us. We are excited to accept 29 of these 60 submissions, or just shy of 50% for presentation at the conference. The program committee recommended how they thought the audience would best engage with each accepted paper's contributions, 20 long presentations, and nine of short presentations plus posters. Of course, those recommendations were made when we envisioned a different sort of conference, and we thank all the authors and participants for working with us in the shift to virtual. Now I'll turn it over to Stephen to talk about how we're actually going to organize this as a virtual. I'm going to provide an overview of the, the meeting as well as talk about the different um, conference tracks that we have um, as part of Pervasive Health this year. In addition to the main track, we have um, the poster track that was organized by the poster chairs, um, Oscar Mayora and Karina Caro. Um, additionally, there are two workshops, um, Next Coach and the Collab Design Contributions for per Pervasive Healthcare, or DCPH. Um, and want to thank the workshop chairs, Gabriella Marcu and Vinit Osmoni. Um, as well as the doctoral consortium um, that was chaired by uh, Jochen Meyer and Anu Prabhu-Hawker. The, the main track of the conference is organized into two days and nine sessions. Um, we're going to start off the conference with a keynote address by Dana Lewis. The keynote address titled, um, We Are Not Waiting and Neither Should You, really encompasses the great work that Dana Lewis has done. Dana is the founder of OpenAPS and the creator of the do-it-yourself pancreas system. Uh, in her work, Dana has really focused on a community-driven open source movement that's produced many innovative technological improvements for managing type 1 diabetes. She's an independent healthcare researcher, um, and she served as the PI or co-PI on numerous grant-funded projects, leveraging open source diabetes technologies to improve diabetes care, and published the first book on automated insulin delivery, the artificial pancreas technology. Dana's work is really a um, epitome of the work that we uh, come to appreciate at Pervasive Health and really looking forward to her keynote address. Additionally, we'll have six full presentation sessions um, organized into topics health and families, information needs, behavior change and messages, clinicians and patients, pervasive health across generations, and sensing and sensors. 
one session that covers those short presentations, um, which Sean mentioned, and then a poster session as well. I know one of the challenges and one of the questions about the virtual format is how do we interact with each other? Unfortunately, we don't all get to be together in Atlanta, um, but we do have the benefits of using Slack for questions during presentations between them and even after the conference. And we hope this is a great way for the pervasive health community to continue to connect even though we're not all together in Atlanta. I wanna now acknowledge some of the especially fine work that we saw um, submitted in terms of pervasive health and announce the awards. So I'm gonna start out with the best paper honorable mentions. There were two papers that were awarded best paper honorable mentions, Design and Care for Discordant Chronic Comorbidities, a comparison, comparison of healthcare providers' perspectives, authored by Tom Ongwar, Gabrielle Cantor, James Clausen, Patrick Shee, and Kay Connolly and Designing Everyday Conversational Agents for Managing Health and Wellness, published, uh, authored by Ji Yun Shin and Gina Yu. Uh, and now, the best paper announcement. Open Speech Platform Democratizing Hearing Aid Research, published by Demen Skandupa, Tamara Zubadi, Sean Hamilton, Arthur Boothroyd, Kagri Yelson, Desai Yang, Rajesh Gupta, and Harnath Garadar. Congratulations to the Best Paper Award. And that's it. We hope you enjoy the conference and really have an opportunity to connect and engage around this great scholarship that's been presented. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to EAI Progressive Health 2020 conference held in this virtual interactive setting. I am Karolina Martinova, the EAI conference manager of Progressive Health 2020. Unfortunately, I am not able to meet all of you in person, so I'm using this opportunity to address the organizing committee, the keynote speakers, the authors, and the participants on behalf of EAI. I would like to thank all of you for being a part of this conference and for your involvement with EAI. In particular, I would like to thank the General Chair Rosa Ariaga and Program Chairs Sean Munson and Stefan Schuller, together with the whole organizing committee, for their hard and excellent work throughout the whole process of the conference preparation. Today, during this streaming, you can actually participate in two ways. Firstly, you can join the Q&A on Slack through a link that you can see below this video. Secondly, you can vote on individual presentations and leave your fellow presenters feedback on their work through EI Compass. We will shortly show you how to use and access this platform and how to leave and receive feedback for presentations in this conference. I would also like to use this message to invite you to join us again at EEI Progressive Health 2021. Should you be interested in becoming a part of next year's organizing committee or the technical program committee, please do not hesitate to contact me at my email address below. Similarly, if you're interested in discussing other possible cooperation, a conference, a workshop, or a new event altogether, please contact me at my email address as well. Now, my colleague Michal will present you with what EAI does, who we are, and how you can get involved in our various activities. Thank you for your attention and enjoy EAI Progressive Health 2020. Hi everyone, my name is Michal Dudic. I'm the Committee Manager at EAI, European Alliance for Innovation. It's my pleasure to welcome you at this conference uh, and say a few words about who we are and what we can do for you and your research career. In short, EAI is a global community for a greener, healthier and smarter world. As of today, we are home to more than 60,000 members from 167 countries and we reach out to tens of thousands of subscribers. As an organization, we are nonprofit from day one, and what is most important to us is that we remain open to all researchers from all around the world thanks to membership that is completely free. We organize more than 100 events annually, such as this conference, and we do so in publishing partnership with Springer. I said in the beginning that EAI is a community, so let's talk about what that means and what it means for you. To put it briefly, we give our members a platform that builds their research. We do it with three main online community services where members come together to help each other write a better paper, get an objective review, and get recognized fairly. The three services in question are EEI Compass, Community Review, and EEI Index. 
Firstly, EAI Compass is an online app where you can meet and connect with new colleagues and get feedback on your paper as well as your presentation. In addition to that, it lets you download all full papers that will be presented at this conference and you can vote on your favorite presentations as well as see everyone who is here and connect with them. You can do this right now if you go to EAI Compass website, compass.eai.eu. Next, we are improving the classic conference review process with community review. It has already been in use at all our events since 2019, and we were very excited to hear a lot of positive feedback from program committee members regarding the reliability and the speed of the community review. Let's talk briefly about what community review does. Essentially, it is a website that shows abstracts of papers that are right in the middle of the review process, as long as the authors allow it, of course, and all EAI members may then bid to review specific papers. When they submit their bid, they put in their bio and their qualifications, which are sent to the program committee, who can then decide whether or not this bidder is qualified to review the paper they bid on. This relatively easy access to review opportunities means that bidders really need to put their best foot forward if they wish to be selected, which improves the quality of the entire review process. At the end of the day, this benefits you, the author. And last but not least, let me tell you a thing or two about EAI Index. EAI Index is our credit-based evaluation system that we rolled out this year to all of our conferences and journals that allow you to climb the global ranks of EAI community and get recognized for your work. It calculates a number value for most actions you make, such as getting your paper accepted or submitting a review, and these numbers accumulate for 12 months. At the end of this 12-month period, we put together a ladder of all EAI members, and the ones at the top receive a nomination to one of the membership ranks – senior member, distinguished member, or fellow. For each action that is eligible for EEI index credits, we'll look at the quality of your action as it was evaluated by another member of the community, such as, for example, the review score of your submission. To make sure that the system is fair to newcomers, every 12 months the credit count gets erased, the ones at the top receive their nominations, and every member starts at zero for the following 12 months. And finally, Smart Submit is a collaboration feature that is coming later this year. It will allow you to submit your research ideas and your work in progress abstracts to get the kind of help and feedback you're looking for. Maybe you are looking for co-authors, maybe you would like to find a mentor or a mentee, or maybe you want to find out how the community feels about your idea. This is what Smart Submit is designed for. Ultimately, it's about helping you write a better paper and increasing your chances of getting accepted. Again, we will be launching this feature later this year, so stay tuned. And so I'm going to leave you with many different ways to get engaged at different levels. There are lots of opportunities in many of our events and publications, which means many ways to connect with people and collaborate. You may learn more about everything I just talked about at our website, eai.eu. These services exist to help you and to make your lives easier, so we encourage you to send us your comments, ideas, and feedback to community at eai.eu. And if you're interested in volunteering and contributing, you can let us know at the same email address. Don't forget that you can use EAI Compass to vote on presentations in real time to determine which ones are the best, as well as to download all full papers that will be presented today. Just make sure that you log in using the same email address as the one you used to register to this conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please enjoy the conference and I hope we will see everyone online soon. Hi everyone, I'm Dana Lewis and I'm honored to give the keynote today for Pervasive Health talking about the We Are Not Waiting movement and what we can learn from patients who are innovating and researching in healthcare. Now, when I talk about innovating and researching in healthcare or anything related to healthcare, I think it's really important to start with centering ourselves on what the purpose of the healthcare is, which is helping a patient, a person. And I think it's really challenging to understand what it's like to be a patient until you've been one, whether that's for an acute situation or a chronic illness, 
But as a patient myself, I often equate it as like I was being struck by lightning when I was diagnosed with a chronic disease. Because for me, there was a clear before and after in how this impacted my life. For me, it was being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 14 that really made me feel this way. But I recognize now, today, there's actually a situation globally that has impacted pretty much everybody that may help us understand this example of the before and after being different. And that is COVID-19. What you might have thought about the world and how you lived in January or February or March to today is drastically different for all of us. And it can be overwhelming and uncertain. And in a lot of cases, it feels like we're building the plane as we fly it. There's not much evidence, or in some cases, people say there's no evidence for the treatments we need or we're discussing or hypothesizing for things like COVID-19. But this is kind of common in other chronic illnesses, too, that we've known about for hundreds of years or dozens of years, where people will often say there's no evidence for a treatment. But no evidence, when people say that, what they really mean is there's no perfect evidence. And oftentimes there is evidence, but it might be the different type of evidence that they're looking for, or they're wanting absolute certainty and one answer and one solution. But for so much of what we're dealing with in healthcare, whether it's something that we know well about, like type 1 diabetes, or something new and uncertain and dangerous like COVID-19, chances are there's going to be different types of evidence, and we have to learn how to layer these different types of evidence together to figure out how to move forward. And it can be really challenging for things like COVID-19, as I'm sure you felt, whether it's personal or professional, to deal with the uncertainty and also the sense of urgency of feeling like we need to figure this out now. Maybe we needed to figure out months ago what we're going to do and how we were going to collectively as a society figure things out. And again, that's no different than those of us living with chronic diseases for many, many years. In fact, for me, living with diabetes, type 1 diabetes, I have to give myself insulin every day. And I use a continuous glucose monitor to tell me what my blood sugar is. And that continuous glucose monitor tells me what my blood sugar is going up and down and how it's responding to things like food and exercise and insulin. And that's the ultimate sense of urgency. Because at any given time, my blood sugar could be rising or dropping, and I need to stop what I'm doing and pay attention to it. What you see on my screen here is some images from a continuous glucose monitor graph and pictures I took on a week where I was doing everything I could and trying my hardest. And you can see the number of times that I went high and low and high and low on this graph. This was a set of pictures I took from my doctor when he requested to see my data. And it was so frustrating that I tried to do everything that I could. I'm educated, I'm privileged enough to be able to access these tools, but these tools aren't perfect. Now, the continuous glucose monitor will tell you what your blood sugar is every five minutes, but it doesn't talk to the insulin pump. And the insulin pump is nice because it gives you insulin throughout the day, but it's pre-programmed, which means if your blood sugar actually goes low, by design, the insulin pump continues to give insulin because it doesn't know about it. So essentially, the insulin pump is, des is designed to overdose you, which can be really, really scary to think about. And that's what makes diabetes so hard because you as a human have to look at the data from the continuous glucose monitor or decide how you feel and check your blood glucose manually and look at data from your insulin pump about how much insulin has been given in the past, think about what to do and decide to give more or less insulin, eat food or change your behaviors. And this isn't just something that you do once or twice a day, but this is something that you do over and over and over again, dozens of times a day, 24-7, 365, no break. I've had diabetes now for almost 18 years, and it's very hard to do this, especially when you're trying to do things like sleeping um, or working or playing with your kids or whatever it is that you want to be doing in your regular life. And it got to be really frustrating because as a patient, I did what I was supposed to do. I talked to the manufacturers and asked them to make the devices different. One of my big problems was sleeping through the alarms on my continuous glucose monitor if my blood sugar was low or high. So I said, it's simple, right? Change the alarm, allow us to choose different sounds, allow us to change the volume. And they said that they were working on it, it would be out in the next version, or that I was the only one with that problem. And that's not the case. There's thousands of Google results of people trying to figure out how to make a louder CGM alarm. And that was true, you know, five or six years ago. So it kind of right for me reached a frustration point where I finally said, you know, if we can't change the devices, right? I don't work for these companies. I'm not a device manufacturer. You know, what can I as a patient do? I maybe can't change the devices, but what I can think about is adding new tools on top of my existing FDA approved medical devices. And that's what something I had the opportunity to do back in 2013. 
I actually saw a picture of a gentleman who figured out how to get data off the continuous glucose monitor so he could remotely monitor his son. And I was an adult, so I didn't necessarily need remote monitoring, but I said, oh, if I could get my blood sugar data off my device, I could send it to the cloud, down to my phone, and make a louder alarm, which is what I wanted. And that's in fact what I did. And I was able to not only get my data and use it to generate a louder alarm, but to make smart alarms so that when I told the system I was taking action, it would snooze the alarms if I had already taken action or tell me ahead of time if my blood sugar was going to be out of range. And that allowed me to shift from being reactive and constantly responding to alarms to being able to be predictive about what was going to happen and adjust course before I got there. And that alone made a huge difference. But we even realized by talking about this that there were other components that we could also add into the system. One key component was the ability to talk to the insulin pump, which like I said, didn't know about the continuous glucose monitor data. But by the ability to read and write data from the pump, we could actually put that system all together using the ability to talk to the CGM and talk to the insulin pump, run that data through the algorithm that I wrote to, de to decide what to do. But instead of telling me as the human what to do, we could actually send those commands back to the pump and have the pump give more or less insulin and do it over and over again every five minutes. And so that's what an artificial pancreas or an automated insulin delivery system does. It worked really well. And again, this was using my standard FDA approved medical device, my insulin pump, my continuous glucose monitor, and as you can see, a small piece of hardware that you could buy online to bridge the communications between the devices. And this was absolutely life-changing for me. As I mentioned before, when I was trying my hardest and doing everything manually, this is what my graphs would look like. But after, with a system that was making decisions every five minutes and making small changes and paying closely attention, this is what my graphs look like. Straight line, straight line, straight line, hardly going out of range. When I did go high or low, it was fairly minimal for a short period of time. And this is one of the things that's really amazing is the system's not perfect, it's not FDA approved, it's not manufactured by a company, but it was absolutely a game changer in improving my quality of life and making it so I could feel like I could go to sleep safely and just live a better life 24-7. And I think it's challenging oftentimes for people who work in healthcare, there's reasons why things go through regulatory processes and come to market traditionally. But the challenge with that is it takes all the way to a final product that has to be proven to work for the average person in a large population for these systems to get FDA approved or regulatory approved and brought to market. But the difference with patient innovation or solving a problem for a small group of people rather than purporting to solve a problem for an entire disease group is you're not necessarily trying to make a perfect thing that works for everybody. But you're able to look around and say, look, I have a problem. And maybe in this example, I don't know how to build a car. But the point of a car is to go from point A to point B. So how else could we solve this problem with the tools that we do have? And in the case of patients, we often say, well, look, we've got a block of wood and some wheels. Let's make a skateboard. That'll help us go from point A to point B more quickly. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, I've got the steering component. If we add the steering column to it, we could steer better. And it becomes a scooter and then a motorized scooter and then a bike and then a car. And all along the way, all of those steps, people's problems have been solved. Their quality of life has been improved. You've learned along the way and you didn't have to wait years and years and years the way we traditionally have to wait in healthcare, which can be really, really frustrating. So I think today, most of you are probably at home or in your office without a lot of people right now. You know, we're still not socializing with people as much or wearing masks and doing everything we need to do for COVID-19. We started asking the question of, okay, at some point, these lockdowns are going to end and we're going to want to go back to what we consider to be normal before or socializing more. So what do we need to do to be able to enable us to reduce social distancing in the future? And in fact, we didn't just ask this question recently, we asked this question back in February when COVID-19 was first starting to spread across the United States. And we realized that we needed to limit the risk of getting COVID-19, but also reduce the risk and the likelihood of giving it to somebody else. And so we started asking the questions of, okay, as public health is getting up and running and as our country is getting up and running with testing and trace, contact tracing, you know, and all of those things, what can we as individuals do to make it so that we feel safe to start to extend our bubbles and start interacting more with the world and recognizing that, wow, we as individuals have a lot of power to impact our communities. And we asked the question of, can we apply what we learned about open source, which we used in the diabetes world for several years before, to help us as a community address the spread of COVID-19? And the answer to that, after a brainstorm, was yes. 
we can use the Bluetooth technology in our mobile phones to anonymously and privacy preserving trace interactions with other mobile devices and do symptom reports to alert other people. So we used all the lessons we learned about making small changes and trying to solve a problem we thought we had using the technology that we had for COVID-19. And we in fact built an app called COEPI, which stands for Community Epidemiology in Action, as an open source privacy preserving app for symptom sharing and alerting. And you've probably heard about this idea of digital contact tracing or digital exposure notification. We were one of the first groups that really started working on this and doing it in open source before Google and Apple announced what they were doing. But one big difference from us and everybody else was recognizing that we as a community can do things with symptom sharing and alerting earlier than we could when you have to wait for testing, test results, and then the official notification of a confirmed case. Because we recognize that if you stop symptoms from spreading across the community, you're not only going to stop the spread of things like COVID-19, which we're all really cognizant of right now, but colds and the flu, it would be great as a community to stop those too, because the flu also, as we know, kills a lot of people. And it would be great as a community if we could take action and do that. So when you look at the timeline of traditionally with COVID-19, it takes days for somebody to become symptomatic and symptomatic enough where they might consider getting a test in many cases, but it takes a while to get results. So at that point, they've already been infecting and exposing other people along the way who then may become infectious and expose other people. And so if we start with additional tools and not just waiting for the confirmed COVID-19 test and diagnoses, we can actually use symptom reporting when the first symptom appears to alert people and let them know that they should be careful and change their behavior, whether it's staying at home, upping their masking, isolating within the household, things like that, to reduce the number of transmissions and the number of exposures that are happening into the community. And I think it's really valuable to think about, you know, what can we do as community members? What can we do as individuals or a small community? And the lessons I learned from OpenAPS and this open source diabetes world were something we were able to put into play right away when we first learned about COVID-19 and started thinking about it back in January and February for us. And that's something that I wish we could take forward into all of healthcare is recognizing that for many of us, we don't know what you can do until you could try. And so it's really important to try. Maybe the solution isn't perfect at first. Maybe it's not gonna work for everybody, but if it's able to save a few lives, if it's able to improve lives, we should absolutely try and start working on that and then share it so that we can continue to improve on it. And I think it's really important to not wait for perfection because anything is better than nothing, especially when we think about things like COVID-19, what we've learned over the last six to seven months, or things like type 1 diabetes or living with cancer or living with cystic fibrosis. There are so many diseases and conditions where if we make small changes for people and improve their quality of life, millions of people's lives could be improved. And that is something that's absolutely worth pursuing. And the other lesson that I wish we would take forward into all of healthcare is recognizing that small changes made iteratively and quickly can be multiplicative. And especially when you work out in public and share things open source and freely, you can have other people come along and share ideas and contribute or take a version and make it better. And that's something that's absolutely happened in the exposure notification technology space. People who started working on the open source version were able to then leverage the Google and Apple API for exposure notification and vice versa. And then also for diabetes, there have been now multiple DIY do-it-yourself open source systems that were created so that thousands of people with diabetes have been able to have improved quality of life before the first commercial systems hit the market, and even today when these commercial systems aren't universally available. And I think also when we kind of talk about the context of COVID-19 and use it for an example to decide, you know, what can we learn from this and what can we take forward? I think a lot of us can be nostalgic for, you know, what we called the old normal, the old way of doing things. And I think it's important to recognize that the past wasn't perfect. The infrastructure we had, the ability to access healthcare, healthcare in many cases wasn't perfect. And so we shouldn't be trying to go backwards, back to what we had, but use the opportunity, use the sense of urgency around COVID or whatever it is that you're working on and try to design and build a better infrastructure and a better future. But I think 
it's very common for us as people in society and in society as a whole to say, well, you know, we need to do X and Y and Z and somebody should be doing that. And, and, you know, whether it's another person, another organization or a governmental entity, it's very easy to be like, well, they should be doing these things. And that's absolutely true. There's always improvements that other people can make. But I think at the same time, it's really important to focus on everything that we can do right now. Again, whether it's COVID-19, type 1 diabetes, or any disease or healthcare condition that you're working in, I hope you recognize that there's a sense of urgency for all of us. And there's an opportunity to do better and move more quickly. And that's why we and the diabetes and the healthcare patient community have often said, we are not waiting. And I encourage you to join us and say, we are not waiting. And let's make healthcare better. Thank you.
Hi everyone, my name is Qingyang Li. Today I'll be introducing our research entitled Supporting Caring Among Intergenerational Family Members Through Family Tracking. Family members have an inherent desire to communicate and stay aware of each other's health and well-being. However, sharing health information among family members could be challenging in an intergenerational family context. Between parents and their adult children, lifestyle differences or living in different locations may result in families not communicating sufficiently. Different generations may also prefer different information channels, and older adults are often left behind since they may not on the same technology platform as their middle-aged children or younger generations are. Previous research on family health communication has discussed eating habits, sleep qualities, family-focused exercise games, and care-related behaviors. Self-tracking tools with data-sharing features have the opportunity to facilitate support, awareness, and advice about health conditions between older adults and their adult children. However, it is unclear for it is unclear if self-tracking tools can initiate health-related conversations among intergenerational family members, or how family members can implement these tools to support caring. So, we sought to explore whether physical activity self-tracking tools could facilitate sharing of health information and caring for one another. In this presentation, I will give an overview of the work we have done during the past year. We present results from a qualitative study involving eight intergenerational families to understand how a family tracking intervention can help support care among intergenerational family members. These findings suggest the design of family fitness sharing to account for the age differences in intergenerational families and support the unique needs of family fitness sharing. I will explain my work in four parts, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. Personal informatics literature examines the idea of tracking for self-understanding. While most personal informatics research has focused on self-tracking, research is increasingly being conducted in a family context. Particularly related to our work, we at all studied we want to understand how people shared fitness data in pre-existing social networks. And look off at all, studied mobile food journaling to facilitate family support for healthy eating. So if you are interested in these related studies, you could refer to our paper for more detailed information. And now we are going to talk about research methods. This research is based on the usage of WeRun to study the family tracking. So what is WeRun? Before I introduce WeRun, I will first introduce WeChat, the social platform where WeRun embedded. So WeChat is a messaging and social media app which was widely used in China, like Facebook in America. WeRun is embedded in WeChat and was built on pre-existing social relationships on WeChat. All WeChat contacts who have signed up with WeRun will appear on the leaderboard. WeRun ranking automatically ranks the daily steps of users and their contacts who also use WeRun. Users can like each other's step counts. Users can follow a specific contact, which places the contact step count at the top of their WeRun page. And WeRun also sends a summary of users' daily step counts as a form of leaderboard at 10 p.m. every day. Besides WeRun, we also developed and launched a WeChat mini program in the group to lower the technical threshold for older adults to use WeRun and to facilitate our research team in collecting step data. And this is the user interface of the mini program that we developed. We used the snowball sampling to recruit eight family units, uh, which is 27 people in total. Each family unit consisted of at least three adults. All participants used Mandarin to communicate as a family, 
and were located in the urban area of central and eastern China throughout the study. We divided participants who into three age groups based on their working status as retired, working, and in school. The older adults who participated in the study were autonomous, either, general, either generally healthy or having slightly functional impairments. We invited our participants to family chat groups and asked them to share their daily step counts collected by Weiran in those groups. We require families to participate in the study for at least two weeks. They could also have access to other social functions in Weiran, as well as the mini program. With their permission, we recorded their group chat logs during the study until conversation ended. At the beginning of the study, we conducted 30 minute focus group interviews with each family unit to get some basic demographic information and understand their exercise habits. At the end of the study, we conducted 30 to 50 minute interviews with in participants individually to understand their opinions and experiences with fitness tracking and sharing. We qualitatively analyzed the interview and chat log, data, chat log data, taking an approach inspired by grounded theory. So, what did we find in addition to previous studies in the related work? Look off at all find that generally non-shared experiences could extend awareness of family members' behavior and condition. In addition to journaling, we found that the shared fitness data help participants be aware of and understand their family members' current health conditions and help them better take care of one another. For example, B2, an older participant, and B3, B2's adult daughter, had the following conversation across in the first few days of the study. In the beginning, the daughter did not realize her, mom, there's her mom's daily exercise level. The daughter was worried about her mom to over-exercise when she saw her mother work around 20,000 steps per day. Several days later, when the daughter was very familiar with her mom's exercise habit, unusually low step counts now become an alert for her to pay more attention to her mother's health. The daily steps also pr prompt participants to further reason about what occurred to their family members during the day in order to figure out if the unusual data was resolved by external factors such as weather or technical issues or internal factors such as participants' health issues. We found some participants inferred information about each other's health via their daily step counts. While the passive sharing of health-related step activity encouraged others to share more detailed information about their health to the group. For example, when an older adult couple G1, G2 attempt to explain to her daughter G3 their exercise routines, they also told her daughter that they went to get a new pair of eyeglasses because health issues reviewed by G1's Fundus examination. We also find that difficulties in the use of tracking technology also led to tangible support. Extending Lukov et al.'s findings where all tangible support were triggered by tracking re records. Since many older adult participants in the study were new to WeChat and WeRun, sharing fitness data created opportunities for the younger family members to visit their parents to teach them how to use WeRun and WeChat more often than before. Tracking fitness data in a family setting provided multiple motivations for sharing health information and opportunities for caring among family members. Nevertheless, younger participants were reluctant to engage with the app and the study, worrying that the tracking as a family would invade their independence and privacy. C5, a graduate student, felt uncomfortable when his family observed his step count every day and compared his data with his 80 year old grandpa. Well, I would be uncomfortable too, to be honest. They also worried that the act of tracking might motivate them to exercise beyond appropriate level because focusing on steps led them to pay more attention to the numbers rather than the actual experience of their family members. 
aiming to maximize the number of steps instead of enjoying physical exercise or maintaining health. For example, one older participant, H1, who underwent a leg surgery a year before, said she was very happy to see the data but was worried if overexercise was bad for her leg. Our results show two unique aspects of family fitness tracking and sharing. First is family sharing differs from social network sharing. When sharing tracked data on social networking sites, we at all participants were aware that their contacts had diverse ages, occupations, health statuses, and lifestyles, and considered that individual situation and consider the individual situation when interpreting and comparing context step counts. By contrast, some of our participants placed a substantial value on the data and regularly used it to compare family members. However, family members also worried about potential health issues resulting from becoming motivated to exercise beyond an appropriate level. When showing track fitness data in a family tracking system, Instead of using an exact number, one could use a visualization which shows if a person's daily step count falls within the range of the person's normal daily step counts. In addition to helping users move away from solely maximizing step counts, systems could also prompt the users to recall their activity experiences and bodily feelings such as being tired, sour, or lazy when reflecting on their data. And the second unique aspect is, although family members were given equal roles in their chat group, our findings suggest the three age groups display distinctly different behaviors, and it may be insufficient to design family tracking technologies the same for everyone. Older adults attach great importance to the group channel, caring highly about how others saw their activities. Therefore, when designing fitness tracking applications for older adults, designers need to help them gain a sense of achievement, such as design a reward system or guide family members to encourage them more often. Designers also need to reduce the complexity of procedures. One could use onboarding systems or daily tasks to guide older adults to learn and practice these features and provide a convenient platform for them to ask for help from their families. While middle-aged participants often served as the main caregiver and supporter to both the younger and the older generations, they listened to voice messages to pick up any subtle cues which could imply the physical and mental condition of their family members. Our results suggest that this generation is primarily searching for data which deviates from their family members' daily routines to keep aware of other situations. It could also help this generation if Tolu could send reminders to users when detecting abnormal conditions. In this study, most of the time the abnormal data was caused by external factors, such as weather and technical issues, but occasionally, it means that the producer of the data might be in a different physical or mental condition than usual, and that might need help. It could be helpful if a tracking tool could identify on usual data caused by these internal factors. And young participants paid more attention to their independence and privacy than their parents and grandparents. It would be helpful to protect privacy and independence by allowing users to customize what data they shared rather than presume that all participants share information equally. Younger participants also had difficulties engaging in a conversation due to their fragmented attention and lower commitment to engaging. Automatically transcribing voice messages could additionally make it easier for younger generations to quickly scan the ongoing conversation and engage with it. The generations in our study had different expectations and preferences, and it can be really challenging to support all of them. However, we suggest design support different levels of engagement and expertise for different generations. When users are not familiar with the more complex functions, 
it does not affect their use of simple basic functions such as tracking and sharing. As they become more skilled and comfortable with the tools, users can further explore more complex features such as customizing a digital profile and using a reward system to send stickers to other family members. We explore how a physical activity intervention can help support care among intergenerational families. And um, these are the, our findings listed here. So um, because we are about to the time and I'm not gonna read it. And if you are interested in our findings, uh, you can also refer to our paper. Thank you all for your attending and hope the presentation is informative. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Jamara Sandbolt. I'll be presenting a paper named Design Spatial Analysis of Health Technology for Families, a Systematic Review. Study Family Health has inspired a large body of investigations aiming to uncover their needs and to address their unique challenges. For example, researchers have Considered female families' needs in terms of supporting members dealing with or managing a health condition and how to support members in health promotion. Indeed, it, there has been a growing interest in research on family-centered health technologies. However, we think it is important for the field to have a comprehensive synthesis and analysis of this topic. We claim that a review of prior studies is valuable for researchers to look at what we know so far, to observe open research questions within the field, and to identify design opportunities for future investigations. We think it is important to learn from multiple studies and what they agree on and to know how well such design solutions are serving the needs of families. In this study, we present a review of studies that combine both family health and health technologies topics to assess the current space of design solutions for family health technologies. We wanted to investigate which family health topics have been researched extensively or not, and to identify hidden aspects and opportunities for family-centered health research. The specific contributions of our study are to help guide future research by characterizing what we know, what we have learned, and the limitations of existing research field. We also contribute with recommendations for future work focused on designing for more diverse backgrounds and settings, constructing more representative study populations, expanding the lens of family health, and grounding the research more in theory and different family dynamics. Our systematic review was guided by the following research questions to assess what we have learned from prior studies in family health and health technology topics and to identify future research opportunities. For our review, we follow the these five steps. Database search, abstract screening, full text screening, data extraction, data analysis. We also defined that papers were included in or excluded from the data if they met a set of criteria based on prior studies reports. 
In this presentation, I will go through our process quickly, but you can find the full details of each step in our paper. Our database search consisted of three literature searches conducted in between October 2018 and July 2019. We used six databases to search for our papers, at, for example, ACM Digital Library and IAAA Explore. We also developed a search string that included up to 35 and or terms across two categories, family and health. We reviewed a total of 13,000 titles, resulting in 351 relevant titles. After finding relevant titles, we independently read the abstracts. If the abstract showed that the paper was related to family health technology or an intervention among family members, then this paper was selected for a full text screening. We selected a total of 81 ti titles for the full text screening. In the full text screening step, we checked those titles according to our eligibility criteria, which included, for example, that the paper needed to be published in English. Based on our criteria, we excluded 26 titles, which gave us a total of 55 titles that met our inclusion criteria and were, using, and were used in our analysis. In the data extraction step, we collected key pieces of information from each paper. For all the papers, we read very detailed the paper's result, paper's design consideration, conclusions, and future work for analysis. Finally, in the data analysis, we use thematic analysis to identify teams within our data. Our team members work together to apply affinity mapping to help organize our ideas and make sense of all the data. In our findings, we characterize the studies in terms of health technology characteristics and family characteristics. To learn more about the types of technology proposed so far and to investigate the feasibility of the interventions for families. For this presentation, I'm going to present health technology in terms of type of technological solution and technology characteristics. And for the family characteristics, I will focus only on family living conditions and caregivers. First, I will study characterize the type of technological solution in our corpus. 71% of the paper in our corpus employed a design solution for family health. The technology presented in those res research ranged from using commercial tools such as WhatsApp to developing mobile applications, online social networks, and other tools. As shown in this slide, Within the 39 papers we had, for example, 18% of the studies developed mobile applications and 15% of the studies developed systems that combine mobile and web apps with sensors. Also, some studies presented assessment of the family use of the technology in their results. For example, they collected participants' evaluation and qualitative feedback on the system function. In our analysis, we learned that technological solutions seem to fit into two main directions, self-care, 
versus care for others. Studies that focus on individual self-care were meant for an individual to use the application for themselves. For example, Bertozzi et al. proposed a self-management solution for adolescents in India to use a tablet game on their own in order to learn more information about reproductive health and support them on making better decisions related to family planning. And other papers presented technological solutions to monitor and check in on family members, for example, through videos and sensors. A wine study such as Tishuta and Abode develop a system called Social Medicine Box, which included monitoring technology that allowed adult children to check in on their parents and make sure that they were taking their medicine. In terms of family characteristics, we learned that all studies in our corpus included at least two different generations of family members. For example, 16% of the studies reported that tar reported targeting older parents and their adult children, and 51% target parents and their young or teenage children. As for the family living condition, 75% of the studies considered family members living together in the same household, while only 7% of the papers considered members living in different households. Finally, we observe that 53% of the papers define the people who take care of a family member as a caregiver. We distinguish the caregiver relationship in our paper for clarity. We notice that 44% of the papers consider parents as caregivers in a parent-child relationship. We also observe that 31% of those papers target parents in the end, their adult children, to the younger generation as caregivers. This fact is in accordance to previous studies that have found that most young adults' generation will become their parents' caregivers as they age. Some of the technological solutions that were proposed for caregivers is this mobile application that support young adults caregivers with the care of their parents. So this application provided a location of the parent, appointment and medication reminders, and also an emergency family number in case of urgent care. In summary, our synthesis of the study and technolo technology design decisions made in prior works characterize the literature state of art and what we know about health technologies for families. In addition, our study sheds light on existing limitations in developed technology for, families, for family health. So as follows, I reflect on how our findings address the proposed research questions. Our first research question was, how has health informatics informed the design of technology in a family context? So during our analysis, we noticed that health informatics has informed design, for example, by improving health care via managing medication and provision of care. We also noticed some researchers develop tools that focus on engaging family members in health behaviors, for example, through games that encourage physical activities. However, 
we were intrigued by studies which propose solutions for monitoring family member uh, since Recent studies in HCI have affirmed that older adults are not satisfied with monitoring systems due to concerns on privacy or lack of perceived control. We agree that it's important to propose solutions to support older adults aging in place, but we would recommend future rec investigations to take into consideration older adults' reasoning to avoid monitoring systems. Future design should focus on approaches that encourage reciprocal sharing within the family and propose ideas that support mutual co collaboration or health. Next, I'm talking about our second research question, which was, what family characteristics have been explored in the design of health technologies. During our analysis, we observed that the design of technology have explored different family generation, family health conditions, caregivers. However, our results shed light on some hidden aspects, for example, we noticed that only four of the 55 papers focus on family living apart. This is interesting because the recent trend shows that more and more families are living in different households due to different reasons such as education and job opportunities. So the literature shows that when the family live together, they have the benefit of the face-to-face -face interaction. However, when they live apart, they need to find ways to mediate their communication. Therefore, we recommend future research to consider this family dynamic more and to examine solutions that facilitate family conversations about health when they live in different households. Finally, our last research question was, how have prior studies assessed family use and the effectiveness of health technologies? We noticed that some studies assess family use of the technology. They collected some participants' evaluation through data logs, for example, or qualitative feedback of the app function. We know that those um, techniques are well established and they're useful to identify problems within the system and collect feedback about the proposed solution. Yet, we recommend future studies to consider using other existing tools such as the National Dietary Surveys to collect data that will assess the technology within the family. We think that combining measurements of technology evaluation and health outcome will benefit the design and evaluation of health solutions for families by exploring factors that complement their study outcomes. In conclusion, our study reports a systematic review of 55 papers focused on family-centered technologies. Our goal is to see which family health topics have been researched extensively or not, and to identify hidden aspects and opportunities for future research in this topic. During our process, we did our best to collect as many papers as we could, but there is a chance we may have missed some studies during our data search. Nevertheless, our analysis seeks to provide an extensive understanding of the current trend in this topic and propose recommendations for future studies. We hope our study will inspire future research related to family-centered 
health tech knowledge and maybe other researchers will conduct similar studies in different topics for example in a clinical uh, clinical care or different technological tools such as wearable trackers and with that i will open for questions thank you so much for watching this presentation My name is Sogu Song from Samsung Research. This work was collaborated with Naomi Yamashita from NTT Communication and Jong Kim from KAIST. This work is done when I was a PhD student at KAIST. So, my main topic for this presentation is boredom, encouraging working parents to provide emotional support for stay-at-home parents in Korea. Boredom is a Korean word that means embrace or hug. Uh, then, let me start my presentation. Even though childbirth is a valuable event, many new mothers experience mental depression that might include mild mood anxiety. However, 10 to 15 percent of new mothers might slide into a severe condition, including sadness and fatigue, because of hormone change, uh, their body condition change, and parenting stress. Prior work shows that the importance of focusing on social factors to help reduce mental stress, especially from their spousal support. However, unfortunately, many fathers in specific countries think that childcare is a mother's responsibility. For example, this graph shows traditional stereotype about men's and women's role. The question is that do you agree with the man's job earn money? Woman's job look after home. 40% of South Korea people agree the traditional stereotype. And more than 50% of people living in India, Russia, and the Philippines agree that. Although fathers participate in more child care and housework than before, Significant fraction of mothers are responsible for child care in most Asian countries. Especially in South Korea, mothers spend on average 3 hours more a day with their child than fathers. Also, fathers in South Korea only spend 6 minutes a day for child care, whereas fathers in the U.S. spend 76 minutes a day. This video shows an example of a father who is not interested in child care in South Korea. Mm. Mm. <laughs> And this is another example video in Korea. Ayan, like the video examples, many TV programs in South Korea assess the issues of father's participation in the child care. Our goal is that to reduce mother's parenting stress, 
how to encourage working fathers to provide emotional support for stay-at-home mothers. Our main idea is coming from two research. First is that working parents' indifference to child care and underestimation of mothers' parenting efforts cause conflict in Korea. Working fathers spend the most time in the company, so they don't truly understand the mother's efforts or stress on child care. Other research shows that how emotional support, particularly from their spouse encouraging word, is a critical factor to reduce parenting stress. This is our study procedure. Uh, firstly, we conducted a preliminary study with 32 mothers and 35 mothers via online survey. Uh, then, we designed a mobile system called the bottom based on the result of the preliminary study. Uh, finally, to evaluate the potential of our approach, we conducted a feasibility study during two weeks with nine families. The goals of the preliminary study are to understand working father's understanding of their spousal parenting stress and mother's willingness of sharing baby status with their spouse and possibility to use technology to support them. We used the recruit scale and open-ended questions. We asked both parents the following two questions. How would you rate the difficulty of childcare at home all day? And can you predict the response from your spouse for question one? Based on their answers, father seems to have a relatively good understanding of the burden of parenting. However, Interestingly, mothers felt that their husband's estimation of the child care burden was significantly lower than the actual burden. Some mothers reported that since their spouse did not get involved in child care, they did not understand its difficulty. According to the survey answers, many fathers wondered about their baby status when they were working. In addition, Many fathers were also interested in not only their wife's stress level, but other health-related activity that can be neglected during child care. Interestingly, most mothers responded that they want to share their stress level and child care activity with their husband to increase their husband's understanding of their work and their stress only accepts their lo location information because of the privacy concern. Based on the preliminary study, three design implications were drawn. First, mothers staying at home wanted to share about their baby status and childcare activities. Second, mothers wanted to show some evidence that they were actually experiencing some stress because they felt that fathers underestimated their parenting stress. Third, Working parents wanted to know not only about their baby lives, but also the health-related activities of their spouse while they were away from home. Finally, we designed a mobile system bottom based on the result of the preliminary study. A bottom consists of three components. First, a wearable device to monitor stay-at-home mother's stress, so the stress level is measured by your smart band automatically. Second, a tracking application to track the state of stay-at-home mothers and their baby. A third, a communication feature that allows working parents to access the data and give simple feedback to their spouse. Mothers or fathers can drag the proper icons and drop to the right of axis to express their status. Stay-at-home mothers use this application in a home, working fathers this application in a working place. And now, I'll introduce with a usage scenario. Mothers can record baby status and their childcare activity by drag and drop the proper icons to the right boxes. Mothers wear a smart fan to measure their objective stress level. However, the objective stress level is automatically measured by horse rate variation, and it cannot distinguish positive and negative stress. Our focusing is mother's parenting stress, that means negative stress. So, we decide to use subjective stress level. Whenever objective stress shows high stress level, the application asks mothers if their stress is positive or negative. 
When mother inputs negative stress by dragging negative emotion, the application will send notification to fathers, saying mother is stressed, so you need to discuss about that. After talking about the stress, a fathers or mothers can change the icon to complete the communication. Also, a fathers can comment or feedback on baby or mother's activity with the simple feedback icons. To evaluate the system, we recruited nine families, so nine mothers and nine fathers, consisting of single-income families where fathers worked outside of the home and stayed-at-home mothers who were responsible for childcare in South Korea. The mothers were supposed to wear a smart fan during working time to share their stress level. Each participant was compensated properly after completing the post-survey. We also conducted a pre- and post-survey. In the pre-survey, five record scale and open questions were asked to the participants to figure out their Beijing parenting environment and childcare perception. After the two weeks study, the post-survey was conducted to see the participants change after using Borum. This figure shows the number of execution of bottom from all the participants. The y-axis of the graph represents the number of times bottom was executed each hour during the feasibility study. While mothers usually used bottom regularly while fathers were away, a father seems to use bottom during their micro spare and lunch time at work and after they finished working. By analyzing the application usage pattern and the post survey. We found improved father's understanding of mother's parenting stress by sharing their mother's activity and stress level measured by a smart band. We also found decrease in mother's perceived stress due to improved father's emotional support. And we also found that improved communication between parents about their parenting stress. When the smart fan detected high level of stress, a bottom gave mothers a chance to input their subjective emotion as either positive or negative. To investigate the material use of subjective emotion icons, we asked if they had always entered their true emotions and whether they had ever entered the first emotions. Although most participating mothers seem to enter their true emotions, one mother reported that she often entered a negative icon to exaggerate her stress to her husband. Such exaggeration potentially increased the frequency of notification to fathers. Unfortunately, some fathers reported that repeated notifications made them insensitive. To balance out the symmetric parenting roles, where stay-at-home parents do most of the child care chores, we designed an opposite asymmetric emotional support, where the working parents provide emotional support for stay-at-home parents. However, some parents complained that this design was unfair uh, since fathers are also stressed from work and sometimes need emotional support too. In our study, we tracked the stress of mothers with a smart fan. Since much research has identified the benefit of self-tracking, the result that mothers perceived less stress after losing bottom may be combined with both the effect of self-tracking stress and partner emotional support. However, our approach increases emotional support from their husband. Therefore, we argue that our approach provides its own intervention effect and can complement self-tracking method. We limited our focus to a specific family type, a working father and a stay-at-home mother. Although such a parenting style is very common in Asia, the system does not address the parenting issues present in other family types where parents have equal parenting roles. However, we believe that our findings can be extended to family types having unequal parenting roles. For example, a stay-at-home father and a working mother. 
And that since the spousal support is an important factor to relieve parenting stress in any family, we believe that our study provides insight to the domain of family health and healthcare informatics. To sum up, we proposed on a semester class system, bottom, to induce working parents' emotional support for the stay-at-home parents. And we conducted a two-week feasibility study with nine families and shows that bottom improved the understanding of working parents about spousal parenting stress and facilitated spousal communication. Thank you for watching this video and feel free to ask questions. Hi, my name is Andrew Miller, and I'm going to be talking to you today about some research done in partnership with Anna Cherenchkova. Um, this was part of her master's thesis work. And in this research, we were trying to understand what are the sociotechnical design opportunities for pervasive technologies in the context of families getting better sleep. And our motivation for this study was really that um, getting enough sleep and getting high quality sleep is really crucial. Um, and this is especially true for families with young children. Um, and we know a lot about how technology can help people track sleep as individuals. Uh, but we don't really know very much about how pervasive health technologies might support family level sleep. Um, and so what we wanted to do with this study was to understand how do families currently practice sleep um, what opportunities can we gain from uh, studying them, and what are the barriers that they face? And to do so, we conducted an interview study with 10 families in the Indianapolis area who have young kids. And from this interview study, we're able to provide some formative design dimensions and implications for family-based sleep technologies, and also some opportunities for future research. Um, there is not a lot of related work in family sleep technology specifically, although there has been some recent emerging work. Um, but we are able to draw on work in the pervasive sleep tracking technology world. So specifically, a lot of work by An Kyung Chu et al. Um, studying how do we sense sleep, what does it mean to sense sleep, and how do we help people track sleep. Um, and then when we're looking at the needs of families with respect to um, uh, technologies, we can draw from the domestic HCI literature, which looks at how families incorporate interactive artifacts in their daily life. Um, and so there's a lot of good knowledge from that community. Um, and then more recently, we've been able to leverage the family informatics model proposed by Laura Pina and colleagues um, which itself is inspired by lived informatics and personal informatics models and tries to understand what does it mean for families to track and collaborate around um, home-based health technologies. And so that is the, the related work. There is a little bit of related work now emerging um, looking at family sleep technologies specifically, and I'll get more into that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, in order to do our study, we did a home-based interview with 10 families who had young children. We looked for families who had uh, children that were beginning to sleep independently and facing challenges, and we identified families for whom sleep quality was a concern, but not a clinical issue. Um, and in the interviews, we asked families about their daily schedules, any sleep challenges that they were experiencing, any distractors. Uh, at night. And we also discussed any current sleep technologies that they use, and we showed them examples of technology that they could be using that's drawn from both the pervasive health research community and from commercial products. And then after the interview, families gave us a tour of their houses and uh, or homes and showed us their sleep practices and, uh, and uh, the technologies that they're currently using. And then throughout the interview data collection process, every couple of interviews, we would meet as a research team 
to try and understand what themes were emerging and where we might want to probe more. And then we conducted a, a more fuller uh, thematic analysis after the interviews were completed. And as a result of this analysis, we found um, some themes across three stages of, uh, of nightly sleep. Um, and we've called those bedtime forever, sleeping soundly, and waking. And I will briefly go through each one of these. Um, so anyone who uh, knows uh, kids or who uh, has kids knows that bedtime is this um, simultaneously magic and terrifying time for families. Uh, families told us that this was really the most critical time in their day when they could bond as a family. Um, but they also reported that setting and sticking to regular bedtimes for everyone, but particularly for younger kids, was a real challenge. And so families talked to us about a number of different ways that they were trying to manage this situation. Um, and there were two main solutions here. The first one was trying to manage daily activities. So um, you see in the uh, uh, up top here, there's a little trampoline. This is from a family that uh, tried to encourage the kids to do bounce or jump minutes in order to sort of get their energy out before going to sleep. Um, we also saw, I think every family or, or close to it um, provided a transitional object for their children. This is a, a concept that's quite well known um, in the developmental research community. Um, that's your little stuffed animal or your or your animal friend or your stuffed friend who is able to go to sleep with you as a child so that you don't feel like you're going to sleep alone, but you're not relying on uh, your parents or other family members to go to sleep with you. And uh, this was a key tactic that families tried in order to make um, bedtime uh, happen more smoothly. Another challenge that families experienced was sleeping soundly during the night. So uh, for children, um, threats to a, a good night's sleep included bedwetting, nightmares, uh, and other solutions related, other challenges related to their um, transition to independence. And for adults, caring for children was the main threat to their sleep. Um, it didn't seem to affect their bedtime specifically, but it definitely affected sleeping soundly. And as we'll see later, it definitely affected waking. Um, but parents and other adults in the household also faced challenges not relating to the kids um, at this time, um, especially relating to co-sleeping. Um, we had uh, several cases where um, either the parents had schedule conflicts, for example, one parent needed to wake up much earlier than the other, or um, sleep challenges, so one parent uh, was a chronic snorer and actually ended up sleeping in a different bedroom just so that um, the other parent could get a good night's sleep. Um, so this points to some of the solutions that families tried to work on. Um, uh, they tried to adjust environmental factors, finding the right kind of temperature for sleep. And so on the right here, you see a combination thermostat and, uh, and nightlight. Uh, that can help parents figure out, is the child's room really the temperature that we think it is? Um, and other things such as noise machines. Um, a lot of families used humidifiers when their children were very young, but the humidifiers um, produced a soothing white noise, and they continued to use that even though they didn't need the humidifier anymore. Um, and then also some light monitoring just to diagnose problems, but again, that was more sort of like checking in on the child, very manual. Uh, in terms of waking, the primary challenge here was young kids who really want to wake up and get the day started much earlier than their parents would like to. And again, this will be a familiar challenge. But looking at it through the pervasive health context might be useful here. Um, uh, so on the, um, uh, on the top left, you see an example of a clock that families used. And we saw variants of this um, in, in many of the households. Um, especially designed for pre-numerate children. So um, this clock, and this is a, a common refrain, um, includes a feature where the clock changes color when it is okay to go wake up your parents to try and um, get that example of there are times that are too early and there are times that are just right on time. Um, there were also, um, I talked about briefly before, these schedule conflicts and, and, uh, and work shift related challenges. Um, 
And um, for to manage those, um, we saw some creative examples. So there was one couple where uh, one parent needed to wake up much earlier than the other. And so that parent put their phone underneath the pillow and set their alarm to vibrate so that they could have an alarm that was just for them. Um, and we also saw some regular rules and rituals. So for example, um, uh, on the right hand side here, you see the sign that says, you wake him, you take him. Um, this is for a child who, despite everything the parents tried, always woke up at 5 a.m. Um, and so one of the things that they were trying was to make, make sure that anyone passing by the bedroom was not causing sleep disruptions to the child. Um, so those are some of the challenges and experiences that families reported to us uh, about uh, their sleep practices. We also talked to them about their perceptions of current sleep trackers because we didn't see an awful lot of use of sleep tracking technology. We maybe, I think we had one parent that was wearing a Fitbit watch, for example. Um, and one of the things that came through very strongly um, was this deep skepticism about the value of tracking. Um, and so actually from our last interview, the, the, um, the father in this interview really put it well, I think. He said, I think I know why I wake up in the night. So I think I'm just probably not super interested in the data. Um, and so we often think about uh, personal informatics uh, as providing value through allowing people to interrogate their data. But for these families, the family level sleep concerns, uh, the challenge was not identifying uh, problems. The challenge was trying to come up with solutions. And um, another thing that they talked to us about was, uh, again and again, this concept started coming across of intrusiveness. They didn't want technologies to be intrusive into their family life. And this may reflect um, the nature of the uh, urban and suburban households in the Indianapolis area. Um, but there was this idea that we want to, uh, we feel bombarded by technology and we want to limit our screen time. So these limitations could be something that is disheartening um, when we heard families uh, sort of dismissing the idea of tracking technologies, we were a little worried. Um, but actually in combining these concerns with the opportunities that we talked about um, in terms of bedtime, sleeping, and, and waking, there are a number of opportunities for pervasive health technologies and actually a pretty promising future. So one thing that, uh, that we can gather from this is rather than focusing just on tracking, um, pervasive health technologies could really support family bedtime rituals um, by um, tracking and regulating activity sequences. So tracking the number of books you, uh, you read, um, setting rules, making it more playful, and being able to do so in an unobtrusive way. That's a real strength of pervasive technologies. Um, we could also encourage children's independence through augmented transitional objects. Um, turning a transitional object into an Internet of Things device might be a really promising way of addressing these issues. And in fact, um, Anna has continued to think through this, and this um, on the right, the Pillow Night Buddy is one such augmented transitional object idea that we're thinking through. Um, providing comfort at night uh, could be a real opportunity for IoT devices uh, that are screenless and networked and can respond to situations uh, in a pre-programmed way. And uh, finally, promoting daytime habits, and we know an awful lot about how pervasive health technologies could support that, would be a really interesting uh, approach to helping with sleep. And we could leverage a lot of what we know about daytime activities to promote daytime activities that support proper sleep. There's also some really exciting research opportunities from this research. Um, like I said before, tracking is only part of the story. Um, and families talk to us again and again about processes that really mattered to them. So things that were important to them were reading bedtime stories or taking baths, um, ways of handling nightmares, breastfeeding challenges, changing, uh, chasing the elusive perfect nap. Um, these are all about processes and supporting processes rather than uh, tracking or individual events. And there's been some promising developments since we conducted this research. Um, like I said before, sort of simultaneously with this uh, study, um, uh, Laura Pena and colleagues at the University of Washington have been working on their system Dreamcatcher, and they used a family systems framework from family therapy 
to help inform this design. And in my own current work, I am uh, using a different set of theories also from family therapy, the theories of family resilience, to try and understand how we could design technologies around family processes. And this seems to me like a really good opportunity for pervasive health technologies to make a contribution through um, screenless devices that are networked and attuned to be pervasive in families' lives rather than ubiquitous in their perception. And that we could really think more deeply about what does it mean to create a uh, family process informatics. And uh, I can tell from the other research that's going on now that this is going to be a promising area. And hopefully this study helps provide some evidence for the value of thinking in this way. So just to overview, um, in this study, we were looking at getting enough high quality sleep as a family and the role that technology could play in that. And we conducted an interview study with families with young kids to try and understand these opportunities more. And we provided some design dimensions and implications for family-based sleep technologies. I also want to uh, finish up by thanking you for watching and thanking our participating families and the National Science Foundation, which provided support for the analysis phase of this work. And uh, I want to thank you for watching. Sleep well.
Hello, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Timmy Lulua Prayu, and today I will present to you our paper, Understanding Reflection Needs for Personal Health Data in Diabetes. This work is being presented at Pervasive Health 2020. The key motivation for this work is the prevalence of wearable devices in today's society, more specifically also in health, and the use of such data to inform healthcare. More specifically, continuous glucose monitors, for example, are a wearable medical device that, have, that has transformed the standard of care in diabetes management. However, a key barrier to optimal use of CGM data relates to limitations of data delivery and reporting tools for effective interpretation. So in this work, we focused on two research questions. One, included a needs assessment survey to understand what users desire in decision support tools that help them better reflect on personal health data from CGMs. Additionally, we developed a, an alternative visualization tool, and then we also evaluated the effectiveness um, in enabling users to easily recognize temporal patterns over CGM data, short and long-term periods of CGM data. In this study, in total, we leveraged 20 subjects, which included patients with diabetes, clinicians, as well as caregivers. Specifically from the needs assessment survey, we asked two questions. The first one relates to when users reflect on previous management, what are the key items that they look for? And we identified five key variables that users are interested in in their previous management. Also, we wanted to understand what do users wish existed in decision support tools that would help them with their reflection uh, on CGM, previous CGM data. And we identified that users wish there were solutions that automatically extract patterns, um, detect changes in management, and suggest actionable items. They also desire tools that integrate data from various relevant sources. With this in mind, we developed a visualization method for presenting CGM data uh, this was developed in phase one, it was evaluated, we got feedback, and from that we improved the visualization and this was developed in, in phase two of that and also evaluated. For example, one of the questions we asked users is to take a minute to study the proposed visualization. What insights can you draw about the user's diabetes management? From this, 85% of subjects identified the most prominent insights which is positive from our perspective. For example, subject A, who was a patient, said that from a single week, from the single week CGM, it looks like perhaps weekend insulin rates slash management could be adjusted, and uh, the user should look at changing the overnight basal rates to avoid sleeping low or having low blood glucose during the nights. This was positive from our perspective because the user was able to identify patterns of good and poor management, as well as pinpoint behaviors that lead to management gaps. So with that, just to present some insights, some key insights that we identified for designing decision, decision support tools include visualizations that, um, or visualizations should include complementary te text to help users easily uh, assimilate the information. They should be concise and flexible, contextually fitting, informative, and actionable. Looking forward, how we used to leverage this insights from this is we want to develop an algorithm for automatically extracting patterns from long-term diabetes data. We also want to develop an interactive pyramid structure visualization for diabetes management. So with that, I say thank you for listening. For more details on this work, please do reference our paper, Understanding Reflection Needs for Personal Health Data in Diabetes. And feel free to contact me personally. My email address is here as well as my website. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Gina Su, and I'll be presenting highlights from our paper, Data-Driven Implications for Translating Evidence-Based Psychotherapies into Technology-Delivered Interventions. Mental health disorders are a leading cause of disability and death worldwide, 
with over 18% of U.S. adults experiencing a mental illness per year. And evidence-based psychotherapy is effective for treating mental health conditions. One such evidence-based psychotherapy is dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT. DBT is a skill-based therapy designed to support people with complex disorders in developing concrete coping skills. And although DBT can help people successfully manage a wide range of disorders, it has generally been difficult or impossible to quantitatively analyze the effectiveness of particular skills in real-world contexts. On the other hand, mobile mental health interventions have the potential to reduce financial and time burdens associated with in-person therapies and to increase engagement and comfort in providing honest disclosure. But only 10% of commercially available depression apps meet evidence-based principles, and many people view current digital psychotherapies as ineffective. However, the translation of evidence-based psychotherapy into mobile apps and the collection of usage data within those apps provides new opportunities to conduct analysis on the effectiveness of these interventions, informing designs that provide the best possible support. So in this work, we examine the effectiveness of individual DBT skills using Pocket Skills, a mobile app designed to provide holistic support for DBT, which composed of several modules and skills. We leveraged data from a prior month-long field study of Pocket Skills with 100 participants and applied a combination of statistical and machine learning methods. We collected participant characteristics through surveys and app usage data, including self-reported ratings of skill effectiveness. For example, emotion regulation skills asked people to rate their emotional intensity before and after completing the skill. Using these methods and data, we investigated the effectiveness of individual skills through five research questions. Our first research question asked when participants used these skills. 82% of skills had pre-skill use distress ratings greater than or equal to 3 out of 5. This indicates that skills were used mostly in the moment of high distress rather than practicing the skill to be used for future times of distress. Therefore, designers should consider how to best adapt skills for different emotional contexts. For example, a tool could guide people towards skills that are most likely to be effective in the moments of distress while supporting discovery and development of new skills when not in distress. Our next research question investigated if particular skills were more effective, and indeed we found that some skills were more helpful than others. For example, distress tolerance self-soothe skills resulted in less skill improvement by up to 0.9 points. Looking into why, we found that these self-soothe skills suggest specific distractions from distress that may be difficult to complete at certain times, such as taking a cold shower, whereas other skills generally involved cognitive exercises, which can be completed in most contexts. These findings suggest that activities suggested by these skills are helpful when one has the ability to complete them. Therefore, designers should consider how to adapt skills for different environmental contexts, perhaps by asking the person if they're able to immediately complete the skill or enabling them to explicitly schedule the skill for future times if they cannot. Next, we looked at the skill effectiveness across different subgroups of people and found significant differences based on age, education, disorder type, and more. For example, having a four-year degree correlated with over 0.4 points less improvement than other education groups. Because individual characteristics are significantly correlated with effectiveness, designers should consider personal context and preferences in designing intervention activities and avoiding unintended disparities. Then we investigated if skill effectiveness actually influences overall improvement in mental health. We found that having skills that resulted in larger improvement after use resulted in reducing depression as measured by validated scales. This means that skills that work well for individuals in reducing the stress may have concrete effects on their mental health. Therefore, designers should consider helping people find skills that work for them. So how might designers do that? Our last research question therefore asked if we could predict a particular skill's effectiveness. Given all participant characteristics and skill usage data, the decision tree classifier yielded the best test accuracy of 72% outperforming the base rate of the majority class, which indicates a potential to intelligently identify effective skills. 
Therefore, future design of such apps should take advantage of predictive models to generate skill recommendations based on skill use ratings, individual characteristics, and the context of use. In summary, we found that most skills are used when a person is in distress, and some were more helpful in reducing distress than others, influenced by individual differences, suggesting that designers should incorporate a range of contextual information. We also saw that skills at work could lead to overall mental health improvement, and such effective skills could be predicted using machine learning methods. Therefore, digital interventions could be infused with intelligent support and personalized skill recommendations. Finally, this work would not have been possible without my amazing co-authors and our support. Thank you. Hello, my name is Begum. I would like to talk about the Thought Journal app, which is designed to confront thoughts that influence sleep. This study is a collaboration among Philips, Eindhoven University of Technology, and Kampenhage Sleep Research Institute. First, it's good to start with the definition of insomnia. Insomnia is defined as having problems with initiating and maintaining the quality of sleep. Tiredness, lack of concentration and irritability are commonly reported problems of insomnia. Lifestyle habits trigger insomnia, for instance, irregular sleep times, excessive caffeine consumption or too much screen exposure before bedtime. Furthermore, co cognitive factors trigger insomnia, for, in uh, for instance, intrusive or dysfunctional thoughts. Dysfunctional thoughts are thoughts that influence the feelings and behavior. Dysfunctional thoughts may lead to an aroused state of mind and disrupt sleep. Very some thoughts and intense negative emotions may lead to a self-triggering state, which is called the vicious cycle sleep. For instance, in the left, uh, you will see an example of a vicious cycle sleep. For instance, a dysfunctional thought could be, if I do not get my sleep, I will not make it through the day. This, this could promote the feelings of fear and irritation, which would lead to difficulty falling asleep and having this could lead to further could lead to more dysfunctional thoughts thought challenging is a common therapeutic process to cope with dysfunctional thoughts for instance the thought i will never be able to fall asleep tonight could be challenged in the cleaning with assistance of a therapist. It's, it, will, it takes several steps to challenge a thought. Firstly, it is important to describe the situation. In this case, last night I went to bed and could not fall asleep. It made me worried about the next day. And the second step is to identify the distortions in thought. For instance, uh, in this case, catastrophizing and black and white thinking. And finally, a more realistic and functional statement is formulated. I will probably get tired and soon fall asleep. Besides, I can manage the next day with less sleep. Behavioral treatment is a long-lasting solution for insomnia. However, only 13% of patients can get access to a clinical expert. A promising alternative is necessary and digitization is ideal in this case. There are already existing platforms to help people manage their insomnia. Thought challenging as a concept may be hard to grasp if provided by a digital medium. And uh, the existing digital platforms 
regarding thought challenging lacks interactivity and personalized feedback. Therefore, further research and application is needed to facilitate the adoption of thought challenging into practice. Therefore, in this work, we introduce a thought journal app which will be a preparatory step to help users recognize distortion on their thoughts through self-report and feedback. On this point, it is important to mention that Thought Journal app is not intended as a replacement of thought challenging. It, on the contrary, it is a medium to help them to prepare confronting their thoughts. Why self-report and feedback? Because unprocessed daily stressors are factors for an aroused state of mind. And self-report can promote rethinking of events, process daily hassles, and evaluate situations in an objective point of view. Additionally, it facilitates emotional processing. On the other hand, feedback encourages individuals to acknowledge the necessity of change. Study objectives. The scope of the present work is design and implementation of Thought Journal app. Furthermore, we carried out a field study to explore perceived benefit, motivation, and user engagement. The research questions we have are what are the perceived effects and benefits of thought journal components? What factors motivate users to commit to thought journal components? And in which way thought journal fit to a broader digital sleep support structure? Thought journal app. Here you can see the screenshots of a thought journal app. Notebook is the main display of Thought Journal app where each thought and its information is displayed. Here, in this example, you can see that a thought is registered with the label Feel Tired. It is typed whether it is a positive or negative emotion is displayed, its ratings, type of information and description. To enter a new thought, it is necessary to click on the plus button below and provide the information on the relevant section and, and rate its type and intensity. There are two types of visualization for a thought journal app. The first one is word cloud and the other one is thought calendar. In the word cloud, the most frequently used term words are visualized based on its frequency and this information is fetched from the description section. In thought calendar, type of thought and it, it is, uh, ta it is uh, label, it is uh, information is mapped on the thought calendar view. Concept development. In the early phases of design, cultural probe study was carried out to get insight in on users' experience with thought reporting. For that, special booklets are prepared to record thoughts, emotional strength, intensity, time, date, and location. Eleven participants filled cultural probes for seven days. The results show that constant reporting increased awareness, curiosity, and consciousness on one's inner self. This part of the work is published as a full paper conference proceeding. Use case scenario. We have developed a persona to describe use case scenario. The persona is called Jane Smith. She is a 30-year-old woman and assistant professor who lives in the United States. Jane is suffering from insomnia. She feels stress in the evenings, and this becomes more intense, especially if the next day is busy. Jane registers her thoughts on Thought Journal app regularly. Thanks to the app, Jane realizes her tendencies and situations that makes her feel stressed.
architecture of the app. We have developed the app by following model view presenter model. Model is responsible for managing databases. View receives interaction and sends to databases. And presenter is responsible for communicating the interactions. User study. We have carried out a user study to explore the potential value and the impact of the app. 16 participants used the app in the age range of 26 to 41. Nine of them scored higher on Insomnia Severity Index. As the instrument of the study, we have used Insomnia Severity Index and User Engagement Scale. As the procedure of the study, we have invited participants for 20 minutes as an introduction session. Then we asked them to use the app for 7 days and we have carried out an exit session. The app was either installed on participants Android device or a device that was provided to the participants. As the exit interview, we have carried out semi-structural interview and the conversations were focused on users experience with the app results the interviews were recorded with the permission of participants we transcribed the audio into text overall two different topics emerged perceived benefit and effect and perceived user engagement we have labeled the transcriptions by through open coding methodology and then carried out thematic structural analysis. For the perceived benefit and effect, three, th three main themes were emerged, which were influence, registration and thoughts. And for the perceived user engagement, two different sets of themes were emerged, user experience and interaction quality. Overall, the key findings of thematic structural analysis are the tool stimulates self-reflection and helps to realize negative and positive mood patterns. The app gives the users a chance to get tuned with the feelings. Thought calendar gives the impression of self-observation. Word cloud helps to evaluate oneself Writing down is easy, yet evaluating oneself is difficult. Additionally, the ratings of user engagement survey are that perceived aesthetic is rated as highest, involvement and enjoyability is rated as slightly lower, which is followed by the ratings of focused attention. This indicates that engagement is high. However, the navigation in between the screens needs to be improved. And finally, a participant explained the benefit of the app as I am more pleased to see that my life was mostly positive plus it enhanced awareness of the things that made me happy. Redesign Based on the results, the structure and the layout of the app is revised. Overall, the visualizations are improved and each layout is designed in an organized way. List is the main screen of the app and each thought is displayed in cards view. Furthermore, the steps to register a thought entry is simplified. Discussion and conclusion. Thought journal is designed to be integrated with a sleep support tool. The findings show that one week was short to understand the effect of the study because it took approximately four to five days to make thought reporting a habit. The present work provides rich information to future designers and user experience researchers who work on the development of digital sleep products. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Hello 
everyone. My name is Mujan Gafurian and I'm going to present our paper which is in collaboration between the University of Waterloo and the University of British Columbia. Our ultimate goal in this research is to understand factors that would be important in design of personality of a virtual agent that can successfully help older adults with their online search. As we all know, there are a lot of low quality articles online some of which may motivate older adults to buy products such as supplements that may have no scientific benefits. Usually these articles have an emotional component that can gain older adults trust and motivate them to buy the products. We believe that by understanding this emotional connection, we can personalize a virtual agent that can succeed in informing older adults about the quality of online articles and can convince them against buying products that may have only costs and no benefits. So in this study, we asked if we can predict purchase tendency based on the identity of the seller and the identity of the older adult who is looking at these products. We also asked if we can extract this information from the profile of the online sellers. To study this emotional connection and identities, we propose using effect control theory. Based on effect control theory, all of our emotions, identities, and behaviors can be explained on three different axes, how good they are, how strong they are, and how active they are. For example, a child is believed to be relatively weak, quite good, and somehow active. These EPA values are gathered through large surveys, and it is shown that people would agree on the EPA ratings for emotions, identities, and behaviors. Also to understand the different identities and preferences, we recruited 22 participants over the age of 50 who were fluent in English and we asked them to rate themselves on these EPA values and also we showed them six different sellers. The sellers were actual sellers of these online supplements and we used their real images and the information extracted from their actual online profiles but the profiles were adjusted in length so they will be similar in size and amount of information for each seller. After seeing the seller's picture and also reading their profile, we asked participants to first indicate how likely they are to purchase the same product from each of these sellers and then we asked them to rate each of these sellers on the EPA scales. We used two measures. The first was the EPA distance. EPA distance showed how far was the perceived identity of the seller from that of the participant. The same measure was deflection, which is a term defined in effect control theory and shows how much the outcome of an event, such as a participant with a specific personality purchasing a product from a specific seller, is expected. A higher deflection is showing an outcome that is farther from what we expect. Now let's take a look at the results. Both EPA distance and deflection significantly affected purchase tendency. Purchase tendency decreased as EPA distance increased, which suggests that participants prefer to purchase the product from a seller whose identity was perceived to be similar to them. Also, unlike what we hypothesize, as deflection increased, purchase tendency actually increased. One possible explanation could be that Deflection increases cognitive processing, and cognitive processing and counterarguments are shown to increase acceptance of the products through distraction effects. We also studied other measures which are described in the paper. For example, we extracted the different identities of each seller from their profiles, and then based on that, we asked how the variance in one's identity or the ambiguity in one's identity affects the tendency to purchase a product from them. And we showed that ambiguity can actually reduce purchase tendency. This may be so because increased ambiguity may lead to increased focus on the non-emotional factors. To wrap up, we found that the participants were more likely to purchase from a seller whose identity was perceived to be similar to theirs, and they were more likely to buy a product if it increased deflection, which requires future work to understand why this happened, we also showed that having more widely varying identities reduces participants' purchase tendency. These findings can inform design of personalities for assistive technologies that can succeed in assisting older adults by adjusting their identity to the identity of their users. Thank you very much for attending this virtual talk and please feel free to contact me with any questions.
Hello everyone, my name is Maitri Bhausar and I belong to Behavior Science Research Team of TCS Research India. Today I am going to present the paper Daily Journals Extracting Insights for Wellbeing. This paper contains efforts from Deepa Adhika, Unnati Palang, Sachin Patel and myself. How did we get the idea of doing this work? During one of the journaling exercises that we conducted in our organization, we asked each participant about their day ahead, events during the day that made them happy or sad, and their mood during the day. In the responses, we found out that people talk about their office work, family-related tasks, hobbies, official tasks, and health issues. They mention the important they mention the important activities and events of their life, which affected their daily emotion. For example, one of the response participants talk about official tasks like submitting paper and writing algorithms, family event like lunch with family, hobby like table tennis, etc. Thus, she talks about various aspects of her life and she also says how much she is excited about algorithm writing, which shows that her well-being is good at work front. Thus, we got the idea of making the system which identifies how a person is doing towards different aspects of their life by identifying, extracting and classifying self-reported activities of the person and analyzing it using emotional balance classifier. So V8 is the system that takes into input journal or diary text and outputs the analysis of different class of activities done by author or planning to do. It also identifies effects of those activities on emotional balance of the author. Here self-reported activities are the activities done by author of the text or activities that author is planning to do in future. This analysis provides the classification of the self-reported activities into one of six categories and how each class of activity affected the author. It provides personalized activity lines for individual with mapping to their emotions. It actually can help people to self-reflect which part of their life is affecting them positively or negatively over a period of time. They can alter or augment their activity for better well-being in the future. Now let's understand the architecture of the system. It takes as an input text obtained from the journaling interface which is in the form of freestyle text narratives. This input is then given to main models in the system emotional wellness detector and activity extractor and classifier. Emotional wellness detector model classifies the emotional wellness of the author in one of three categories, positive, negative and neutral. Activity extractor and classifier system has three different subparts. Text is first given to candidate activity phrase detector, which identifies candidate phrases from the text using particular POS tag grammar, which identifies potential phases from text that can be self-reported activity phrase. These candidate phrases are given to activity extractor to separate actual self-reported activity phrases from false candidates detected by the system. This classification is done using deep learning model. Output of Activity phrase extractor is then given to activity classifier to classify each phrase into one of six categories. Now let's understand training of emotional balance detector model. For training, we used merging of three different data sets, journaling exercise data set that we talked about in the first slide and two freely available Twitter data sets, emotion and airline review data set. To convert uh, Twitter dataset in usable format, we did its pre-processing where we removed RT symbol, URL mentioned and elongations. We also converted emojis into text format. For example, happy emoji was converted into happy text. 
After that, this data set was given to deep learning model having embedding LSTM and RNN layers to classify each text into one of three categories, positive, negative and neutral. This emotional wellness detector gave 75% of training accuracy and 72% of validation accuracy. Now let's understand the method of activity extractor and classifier and how did we come up with it. So to classify each activity, we first needed to identify self-reported activities. And for that, we needed to identify phrases that can be self-reported activities. So we used our own POS tag grammar to identify candidate phrases from input text. These candidates also contain referred activities and bad phrases. Referred activities are activities done by somebody else other than author. For example, he came to railway station. Here came to railway station is referred activity. Non-activity or bad phrases are phrases which does not show only activities done by the user. So, for example, it will give me good results. This is not any activity done by any of a human being. Thus, we need to separate this referred and non-activity or bad phrases from actual phrases. We call those uh, bad phrases as non-activity phrases and we need to separate them from actual self-reported activity phrases. For that, we need to know the context of each candidate phrase. Context is defined by maximum of three prior and past words of the phrase in the sentence. For example, have, have lunch with my friends has I will as prior words and then will have as post words. Thus, this context and candidate phrases are then given to activity extractor to identify self-reported activity phrases. These correct phrases are then given to activity classifier to classify them into one of the six categories. For example, A to I are candidate phrases extracted from the example given in the first slide and from that A to G were classified as actual self-reported activities and HI were the non-activity phrases. This A to G were then given to classifier where it, each of them were classified into one of the six categories. For example, have lunch with my friends classified in family and friends category. Now let's see the grammar used for candidate activity phrase detection. This grammar comprises of three main part of speech tag types verb, noun and propositions. We created our own grammar by trying various combinations of this part of speech text and manually analyzed which grammar includes modes of all activities accurately. We used NLTK library for creating the grammar and applying it onto the text input to extract the phrases. However, as we discussed in the above slide, a phrase can be referred activity or non-activity phrase. Now let's briefly understand the architecture of activity phrase extractor, which takes the candidate activity phrase generated using NLTK and its context as an input. Activity phrase and activity context is separately given as input to two separate embedding layers and output from those embedding layers is passed to two separate bias TM layers. Here machine understands the sequence of words in input and outputs of both bias TM layers are concatenated to give as an input to RNN layer. RNN layer's output is then given to sigmoid layer having two classes activity phrase and non-activity phrase. Similarly, activity classifier model also used combination of BILSTM and RNN layers to classify each positively extracted activity phrase into one of six categories. Now let's talk about 
the data set used for training both activity extractor and classifier models. Activity extractor needed data set which talks about activities done in future as well as in past. It also needed activities done by author of the text as well as someone else. To take the activities done by the user in past, we used HappyDB dataset, where user describes the past life events that made them happy. To get future activities, we used QR resolution dataset, where people talk about activities that they are planning to do in future. In addition to this, we used actual journaling study dataset that we talked about in first slide. We got training accuracy of 87% and validation accuracy of 86%. For activity classifier, we needed to first identify the important classes of a person's life. Initially, from behavior science literature, we got total 12 different classes. We tried to annotate 3000 of the input phrases into these 12 different classes. From which we got more than 90% of the activities pertaining to one of these 5 classes. Family and friends, health and benefits, interest and leisure, official tasks, habits and preferences. This we made to meter total six classes. This five and six class which contain all other activities that did not belong to any one of these five classes. We named this sixth class as unknown category. Thus we got total six different classes and we annotated all input data set in these classes. Notice that most of activities here belong to official tasks. Thus we trained classifier model on it and got 86% of training accuracy and 83% of validation accuracy. conducted an evalu evaluation study for testing the system on unseen data. This study involved asking questions about describing how was the participants day in as much detail and how did they feel about activities today. To get the ground truth, we also told them to highlight the significant activities and also tell us about their general mood in the whole day. This question was asked to total 58 participants in our organization who volunteered to participate from which uh, 37 were male and 19 were female. We asked them to answer this question for continuously 7 working days and from which at least uh, 30 gave answer for more than 6 continuous days. The next table shows results obtained by running the algorithms on the taken input. Emotional balance detector gives 71.3% accuracy from the input data. Candidate activity phrase detectors extracted 1,893 candidate phrases. We manually annotated this candidate activity phrases to know the precision and recall of activity extractor system on unseen data. Thus, from total, total 632 total actual activity phrases, 454 were detected by the system as true positives and 178 were detected as false negatives. Remaining 35 that were detected as positives were actually non-activity phases which were falsely detected as activity phases. Thus, activity extractor gave precision of 92.84% and recall of 71.8%. The true positive outcomes 454 were given to activity classifier and classifier gave overall accuracy uh, overall classification precision 
of 70.61% and recall of 76.6%. Here uh, we show the confu confusion matrix of precision and recall of activity classifier and emotional balance detector. Activity classifier shows that as major amount of activities reported were from official activities and they were classified with precision of 87.69% and recall of 95%. Which indicates that given proper amount of activities on each class, classifier can give very good accuracy. By getting the confidence about our emotional balance detector and activity extractor and classifier on unseen data set, we made a great analytics system which takes input from the person's whole day experience and gives weekly and daily analysis of his day. For daily analysis, it outputs the list of activities and classes of those activities with their affective state detected using emotional balance detector. In weekly report, system gives analysis of how many each type of activities that user listed affected their emotional balance in positive, negative and neutral way. This can help author to understand how their day was passed and reflect upon important things that they talked about and to summarize what are the most important parts of their life. Which part of their life person is feeling bad about or which part of their life is not paying attention to. For example, for given chart, person's habits are cause of negative emotion in their life and they can do something about it. Person can also be happy about the fact that no family and friends related activities are making them sad. But he also needs to make more time for family as there are very less number of activities reported related to this category. Thus this report can help him reflect and work for better future. This system is dependent on third party softwares like Grub and Buildings and LTK. So error coming from those resources propagates to final system. This is one of the limitation of the current system. We also faced missing personal pronoun problem when person does not use I while writing the casual text. This introduced uh, some error in activity extractor. Training data corpus may not be considered very relevant to the uh, test data or the data that we find from journaling. So it might not be very comprehensive. Thus, in conclusion, React is first of its kind tool to extract, classify and analyze self-reported activity and emotional balance. Emotional balance detector accuracy 70.1.3%, activity phrase extractor precision of 92.84% and recall of 71.8% on unseen data. This also provides analysis of summary of activities performed and corresponding emotional balance in a graphical form aiding reflection on general entries. In future we would like to work on activities which a person could not do. For example, I could not go to temple today, I am feeling sad about it. So a activities which person could not do also affects their life. We also want to distinguish between planned and performed activities and we want to deploy our system on web and mobile interface. Here we have the example of one of these deployments diary entry screen where the person can enter uh, into the diary and save it for the analysis. On this note, I would like to end this presentation. Thank you.
Hello everyone. I am Gauri Deshpande working as a scientist at TCS Research India and doing PhD in affective computing under Professor Bjorn Schuller from University of Augsburg Germany. I am glad to present the paper title Laughter as a controller in a stress buster game which is a joint effort of all the authors of this paper Sachin Patel, Sushovan Chanda, Preeti Patel Vasundara Agrawal, Professor Bjorn Schuller and me. What is laughter? Laughter is an act of laughing which can either be a spontaneous response to a stimuli or a conscious effort of making the laughing sound. A conscious effort is usually associated with audible sound. However, a spontaneous one may not have any sound associated. Here are the samples of acted and spontaneous laughing sound. The acted laughing is like <laughs> and the spontaneous one sounds <laughs> <laughs> Irrespective of the category, laughter has always been having therapeutic benefits such as being an effective self-care tool for reducing stress and anxiety. It has also proven as an effective component of treatment for depression. In several studies it is also found effective in reducing pain and heart problems. In a control study conducted in Japan with 56 cancer patients it was found that laughter therapy may represent a beneficial non-invasive complementary intervention in the clinical setting as the intervention group had significantly better cognitive function and less pain than the control group for a short period. from the multiple benefits that the laughter therapy has reducing stress is a prominent and most applied application of it we will be talking about a laughter based stress reduction approach here while talking about stress there are multiple causes of stress which are highly subjective and contextual in nature Also often an individual doesn't understand the severity of stress effects until they become obviously visible. The most recent cases of stress among several individuals worldwide had been the spread of the pandemic disease COVID-19. In this paper we propose a smartphone application based game which is designed such that it helps user in reducing their stress where the users can control the game using their laughing sound the laughing activity not only blooms up a flower but has a significant impact on giving relief to the user from stress if any let us see a demo of the game being used Ha 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 
Stress Buster game is named as Laugh Out Loud or LOL in short. As we saw, the filtered flower is bloomed up by laughing. There are two major components of this game. First one is the laughter detector and the second one is the game design itself. The laughter detector used in this game is built using machine learning techniques. It starts with collecting data to build a machine learning model. We collected the laughter and other similar sounds such as speech and cough of participants for building this laughter detector. We also took the samples of laughter from publicly available datasets such as ESC50 and SSPNet. We used the well-known machine learning algorithm Random Forest which gives an accuracy of 84% on the test dataset. When compared with other ML techniques, we found that this algorithm supersedes others. Even on other datasets, it exceeds the state-of-the-art detection accuracy. This is a very important feature for a model to be used at a game backend. About game design, we followed the serious game design assessment framework. Let us look into the individual components considered in the game design. The game has a definite purpose to help users relieve stress by laughing out loudly. Accordingly, the content has the information shared on the first screen. It says, laughter is the best medicine that stimulates your heart, lungs and muscles, increases your oxygen intake and enhances your happy hormones. The LOL game incorporates laughter therapy and encourages players to laugh out their stress. As a part of game mechanics, the game has increasing levels of difficulty to engage the users and controlled by their laughing intensity and duration. The user is given with done button to stop any time in between. At the end, the restart button enables them to play the game again if they want to. Also, they get an encouraging message if they achieve the highest level in the game, which is great, you have done it. Also, the control mechanism, which is intensity and duration, are not shared with the user so that it remains a surprise for them. About fiction and narrative, the wilted flower blooming up with laughter helps a stressed individual to relate to their own condition and laughter bridges the gap between real and game world which makes the system cohesive enough. To induce relief, flower and green imagery which are found to have positive effect are used. Also, the participants considered in the study belong to the age group of 25 to 60 who do not have any throat related ailments. The study conducted has given steps. The study was executed in a soundproof room so that the conversations and laughter sound remains within the room itself. As the participants enter the room, we take consent from them for recording their voice and capture their age group and current stress level. The survey is completely anonymized. Only if they give their consent, the next steps follow. The moderator gives them instructions to perform and leaves the room. 
As per the moderator's instructions, they respond to a digital anonymized survey which captures their stress level on a scale of 1 to 5 before playing the game along with their age group. Then the candidate plays the game. While playing, the smartphone app captures the information such as the level reached, number of times the player attempted the game and the duration spent by the candidate on the game, which is the time between start and done button press. After playing, they again submit the survey which captures the stress level on a scale of 1 to 5. After this, the moderator enters the room and starts audio recording. The moderator then enters into a conversation with the candidate and asks about their overall experience. We had two versions of the game. The first version had three levels. However, we got a feedback that the levels are very difficult. Hence, later we kept the same energy and threshold for duration and increased the levels to 12, where each threshold was applied to four consecutive levels. 14 candidates participated with first version and 34 with the second version. The threshold values means to cross the lowest level, a candidate needs to laugh with an intensity of 15 units and for duration of 8 counts of laughs, each with a minimum duration of 1 second. While comparing the two versions, we found that version 1 had more candidates reporting no change in stress reduction with, which is SR neutral. Version 2 has almost 30% increment in reducing the stress level positively. The stress reduction is calculated as a difference between pre and post stress recorded for the candidate using survey. With respect to different age groups, it was found that the maximum number of trials in males were made by participants of the age group 26 to 30 years and that of females in the age group 31 to 35 years. The maximum average level of laughter achieved by males was in the age group 41 to 50 and that of females was in the age group 21 to 25. The qualitative analysis of the recorded laughter shows that the quality of their laughter was really loud and audacious. This indicates us to focus on the mentioned age groups for our further studies in order to derive significant conclusions. The highest levels were achieved by male participants in the age group 41 to 50 years. However, the sample size for this demographic was comparatively small which is 5. The age group 21 to 25 years has the second best average levels reached for both male and female. This might indicate that the laughter levels are better calibrated for a certain age group or that the design elements have a better appeal with this demographic group. From the results, it was found that overall 76.6% participants experienced relief in stress. On an average, Duration of 4 minutes was spent by the candidates playing game version 1, which increased to 7 minutes with version 2 of the game. The maximum level achieved by the candidates in version 1 is 4, which is increased to 8 in game version 2. The varying difficulty levels encourage the candidates to spend more time with the game. With reduced difficulty level, participants enjoyed more. From the qualitative analysis of the semi-structured interviews that the moderator had with the participants, it was observed that 50% of the participants who reported neutral stress reduction in the pre and post survey actually felt better and enjoyed the activity. From the conversations the moderator had with the candidates, some prominent and repetitive words appeared and these words were something like, the game is good, I enjoyed playing it, feeling relaxed, 
want to play when my family and friends are around me. I am curious to know how it works. Some less positive feedback also came, such as I do not find motivation to bloom a flower. It is a difficult game. Can I use other means such as speaking or facial expressions to bloom the flower up? These statements indicate opportunities for the future work. There is a need to cater to individual differences in styles and patterns of laughter. This may be achieved by training or adapting the laughter model with individual data. Going ahead, we would like to implement and use an optimized LSTM RNN technique. This is to further enhance the accuracy measure and more accurately detect the laughter instances. We also have the opportunity to serve all personas and demographics better by allowing players to choose game objects and narratives of their choice. We could incorporate design elements such as funny characters, voice mimicry, humorous content that may serve as additional stimuli for laughter. These are the references which we have used while performing study, developing the model and, come and sharing our results. With this note, I end my presentation here. Thank you. My name is Yuki Mantasiochis and I'm a PhD student at the University of Sussex. I'm going to present my work about multimodal fusion of IMUs and EPS body-worn sensors for scratch recognition. First of all, why do we need wearable sensors to detect scratch? As it can be a symptom for melanin and bending conditions, this system can be used to identify this disease much earlier and uh, help the user that way. Also, the same system can be used to quantitatively evaluate how much scratching occurs and this can be directly applied for evaluating the efficacy of a treatment. Basically, if we observe how much scratch occurs before the treatment and after the treatment, we can see the difference and infer how effective the treatment is. Moreover, the same system can be used as a reminder for a treatment. Basically during nocturnal scratches when the user is not aware about if he's scratching or not, the system can remind him when it occurs to put on the treatment and thus the participant will have better sleeps and his skin will be less irritated. So for the data set collection we use electric potential sensors inertial measurement unit which collects acceleration, rotation, magnetic field and quaternion data and for I'm used to get the hand coordinates. The EPS uses this integrated circuit to measure the electrostatic charge that builds up. Basically, when the person scratches his hair, static charge builds up and it's observed in the signal. We also use quaternions to get the hand coordinates as the quaternions encode the general orientation of the MUs. We can get the XYZ position of the hand by using the average human limbs lengths. So for the dataset collection, we used the participant need to follow a strict protocol which was shown on the iPad where they scratched top of head, back of head, side of head, shoulder and leg. And we collected also a big null class with wash hands, drink water, brush teeth, com type to a computer and a walk in the corridor activities which made our dataset extremely challenging. So overall, we had six males, three females, their age were between 22 and 40. We collected 815 scratching instances. The collection time per user was 35 minutes in total. We got five hours, 15 minutes with a total scratching time of 40 minutes. We used sliding window approach where the window left was 0.4 seconds and we used statistical features such as mean variance percentiles, crossing rates and a frequency based uh, feature energy. Then we applied mutual information algorithm to get the five best features for each channel 
and we fed that uh, directly to the machine learning models K9 and Rhino Forest, and we use KFAL cross validation to see how well it performs on unseen users. We use that to evaluate different permutation of RISMU hand corners and EPS data, and how they fuse and how it, that affects the performance. So for course activity recognition, the best performance was using hand corners of 80.6% F1 score and with only one device with IMU and EPS, which is 69.8%. There is significant drop, but it's much better than just IMU. For fine activity recognition, the best performance was again achieved with Rhino Forest and hand coordinates, it was 66.9% F1 score and the best performance with one device with IMU and EPS with Canon, 53.4% accuracy. So to sum up, with IMU, which is just one device, we can achieve 63.8% F1 score, of course, scratch detection. With IMU and EPS, which is still one device, we can achieve 70% F1 score with Canon, but for best performance, what we can hand coordinates which requires four devices and with random forest of 80.7% F1 score. So fusing EPS data with IMU enabled to achieve higher accuracy and smaller variance between faults and it also can fit into one device which means it is as comfortable as Apple Watch. However the best accuracy was with hand coordinates which require four devices. The setup is uncomfortable but the data set was positioned by so that explained the best performance. Hi. I am Ruth Ravichandran, and in this talk, I will be presenting Sleep App, a framework that provides contextualized and actionable sleep feedback. In the United States, an estimated 50 million people have poor sleep quality or sleep disorder. Despite the pervasiveness of sleep issues, people struggle to assess and improve their sleep health. Sleep health in the medical community has largely been focused on the identification and treatment of sleep problems, and sleep health as a recommendation for the general population does not have well-defined measures. When generic population level recommendations are followed and people cannot see the difference in their quality of life, it can be frustrating and discouraging. A good goal for sleep technology is to make personalized recommendations to individuals based on both subjective and objective data, provide actionable insights, and allow for self-experimentation. A new framework proposed by Boise defines sleep health along the following six dimensions, regularity, satisfaction, alertness, timing, efficiency, and duration. In order to facilitate self-experimentation, we identified the following. Environmental and behavioral variables that affect sleep quality are classified as independent variables. These in turn affect nighttime sleep quality, which is measured through regularity, satisfaction, timing, efficiency, and duration, which are classified as dependent variables. Sleep quality in turn manifests as changes in alertness and working memory the following day, which are classified as extended dependent variables. We designed an Android smartphone application sleep app to serve as a user-friendly tool to collect the independent, dependent, and extended dependent variables related to sleep health. We divided the 12-hour daytime period roughly into four windows and collected subjective and objective data through validated tests. Before going to bed, Participants would log pre-bedtime activities in addition to the EMA tests in the window. When they woke up, participants logged subjective sleep quality assessments using a sleep diary and the lead sleep evaluation questionnaire. Throughout the day, we used the psychomotor vigilance test to objectively measure daytime alertness and the NBAC test to objectively measure working memory. We conducted the study with nine participants over a two-week period. This figure shows the repeated measures correlation between duration and sleep quality rating. 
While the number of hours is correlated to subjective sleep quality rating, the range shows that not everyone needs eight hours of sleep to feel well rested. To see the effect of actionable variables on daytime alertness, we included only the variables that participants have a direct control over, such as pre-bedtime activities that were tracked using the journal and the timing and duration of sleep. We found consuming a large meal, electronics usage before bed, and having varying bedtimes to have a significant effect on daytime alertness. Similarly, we explored the effect of actionable variables on daytime working memory. We found alcohol consumption, sleep duration, and varying sleep times to have a significant effect on working memory. Following our study, we wanted to find out how likely people are to avoid behaviors that affect sleep quality if sleep app provided personal recommendations. We also wanted to find out if people's likeliness to make behavior change corresponded to different levels of improvement or decrement in cognitive function. We conducted a survey to explore intent for behavior change with 57 MTurk respondents. The first portion of the survey was about sleep hygiene and their awareness about variables affecting sleep quality. The second part of the survey consisted of example scenarios of recommendations generated by sleep app and the participants' likeliness to make behavior change based on those scenarios. While respondents were more likely to find the nightly recommendations useful, they were not as likely to follow the recommendations from sleep app every night. On the other hand, respondents were more likely to follow the recommendations on the eve of an important event, such as an examination or a presentation. Respondents were more likely to make changes to their behavior if sleep app predicted an improvement in cognitive function than to avoid a behavior when there was a predicted de decrease in cognitive function the following day. In summary, sleep app's models confirmed interpersonal trait variability in sleep, Sleep app provided contextualized sleep feedback using actionable variables that affect a user's daytime cognitive function, and sleep app provided users the ability to perform self-experiments to figure out what they're willing to change to improve sleep quality. Opportunities for future work include facilitating better sleep ex experimentation through data visualization of long-term trends, exploring how timely feedback can encourage behavior change in users, and reducing user burden through passive sensing of objective sleep measures and independent variables affecting sleep. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sam Collison, and I'm a PhD candidate in human-centered design and engineering at the University of Washington. Today, I will be presenting my work in collaboration with a smattering of wonderful collaborators in psychiatry and behavioral sciences creative lab at UW. Consider for the next five minutes that you are a researcher attempting to conduct a large-scale clinical study on depression. Your study is 12 weeks long and will be delivered via a mobile app. Additionally, your study will collect both active and passive data. As with any research project, one of your biggest challenges is getting good data. In past studies that you have done, you've been able to recruit the large sample size that you wanted, but most of your participants dropped out after the first week or two. And you are not alone. Previous studies by my research team and a majority of similar studies retained less than 10% of their sample. This is where our work comes in. We sat down for a 90 minute interview with 20 would-be participants in a study like yours and ours. We asked them to respond to probes to check their understanding of passive data and their concerns about data privacy. And we asked for their feedback on possible designs for a mobile app that we described as being developed for exactly the study that you are running. Here are the main things we took away from those interviews that we recommend researchers like you and ourselves take into account when designing their long-term remote mental health studies. First, design the remote study and digital health app to balance participant burdens for the research goals. Second, support engagement by providing feedback on study data. And third, 
develop an educational consent process for passive data collection. The first takeaway for designing your long-term remote study with a depressed cohort is to balance research needs with participants' needs. For example, you might be excited about collecting voice data because it can be a biomarker for depression. However, we found voice-based assessments were viewed as burdensome. One participant described the cognitive burden of using their voice instead of typing. I feel just a little bit more effort to say it out loud. You have to really know what you're saying, and you have to be concise and say it all at once. But when you're typing, you can take time and pause and delete things, and you don't have to like fully start over if you mess up. So, if you need voice data for a study, consider making voice-based assessments infrequent or giving participants flexibility about when they can complete these assessments, and or informing participants about the research need for these data. The second takeaway is to support engagement through feedback. Feedback may be important for keeping participants engaged because they might feel they are getting something out of what they are putting in. Furthermore, feedback was expected, so deciding not to provide feedback could be detrimental to your study. As one participant said, I assumed that they were going to take the data, analyze, and then kind of give me feedback on oh, we noticed that when you do this, your mood drops. Like, I assumed that was going to be part of this app. That's my expectations if I was going to do this study. From the researcher's perspective, however, feedback could conflict with study goals or have unintended consequences. Therefore, feedback would need to be designed well and thus warrants further study on its own. The third takeaway is that for introducing your participants to passive sensing, information is not education. Just because you explain to the participant during the consent process what data you need to collect does not mean that they fully understand it, and especially understand the risks that it may pose to them. Almost all of our participants said that they were willing to share their passive data with researchers, but we also found that our designs were insufficient to ensure participants were fully aware of what they were consenting to. We suggest that researchers should focus on developing and testing an educational consent process that goes over each type of data being collected and why it's needed for the research, for both during recruitment and during onboarding of the digital health app. In summary, if you are a researcher designing a remote study for a depressed cohort, we suggest considering how to keep burdens on participants low while still meeting your research needs, how to provide participants with feedback to keep them engaged, and how to ensure that participants understand what data your study will collect, why you need it, and the con consequences of collecting that data before they enroll in the study. Though taking these suggestions into consideration will not punch you a ticket for a 100% retention rate, ignoring the participants' need is likely to be detrimental to your study. As one of our participants put it, I constantly need something to remind me why I'm doing this study. I started this, why am I going to continue doing this? I don't care if I quit, I'll feel the same. That's the biggest hurdle. Why should I keep doing this when I don't feel anything? Thank you for listening. I'd like to thank my collaborators, Abby, Jaden, Ryan, Sean, and Pat. Please check out our paper, and I'm happy to answer any questions during the conference, or my contact information is on the slide.
Hello, my name is Jiyeon Shin and I'm a doctoral student at Michigan State University. This study was done with Professor Jina Ho at Drexel University. In this study, we conducted a content analysis of user reviews of Amazon Alexa skills. From the findings, we'll discuss perceived benefits and challenges of conversational agents in everyday health awareness management. Also, we'll introduce design heuristics for developing conversational agents. Conversational agent is defined as the form of a speech dialogue system embedded in personal devices. It became pervasive in everyday context through personal smartphones and home devices. It is predicted that by 2020, more than 70 million users in the United States will adopt at least one conversational agent among Alexa, Google Home, and other similar products. These commercially available conversational agents offer agent applications. They called skills in Alexa, actions in Google Home. For example, Amazon provides more than 50,000 skills to worldwide users in the areas of business and finance, connected car, smart home, and health and fitness and others. With these skills and supporting services, conversational agents have been developed for supporting a wide array of areas, including automobiles, vehicles, learning, entertaining, decision making, health behavior change, and others. In the last few years, conversational agents increasingly became available as everyday technologies. Because agents can seamlessly and closely be integrated into the users' lives and interact with users at all hours, Users can take advantage of them in their daily routines. 
With these benefits, conversation agents offer a potential to serve as a personal health assistant by finding healthcare resources, having sympathy and brief advice for users' emotional concerns, monitoring sleep patterns, or assisting dementia patients as they can repeatedly answer the same question with patients. While they became prevalent in home settings with benefits, it did not automatically lead to successful user adoption. Asians need much improvement in mimic mimicking natural, sophisticated communication among humans. In this regard, researchers continue to discuss how conversation agents can be better designed. They investigated user dynamics around in-home conversation agents, including why and how such products are used, and factors that led to positive user experiences. Second, although users had high expectations when they first purchased conversation agents, user satisfaction drastically decreased once they started using the devices. Researchers investigated communication repair strategies and how agents can reveal human-like cues such as humorous conversation and social intelligence. Also, medical and HCI literature show the possibilities of using conversation agents to assist health management. Existing literature highlighted opportunities, communication barriers, and strategies in designing conversation agents. However, no studies have examined users' perceived usefulness and effectiveness of conversation agents for everyday awareness management that users, users spontaneously adopted. Also, studies were done in a lab-based experimental setting rather than captured users' behaviors and actions in their li living environment. Building on previous studies, we had two main research goals. First, we aim to capture users' perceived benefits and barriers of using health-related conversation agents in everyday settings. We also identified implications for designing conversation agents and the design heuristics that can apply to conversation agents supporting health and wellness. So in this study, we conducted a content analysis of user reviews on Alexa skills. Alexa skills are equivalent to apps for mobile phones, where users can download and activate different applications to be used with Alexa. We chose to study Alexa skills because it presented 60% of market share in smart speaker systems in 2018. As of February 2019, Amazon provided 23 categories of skills, including health and fitness, sports, business and finance, education and reference, and kids. For the skills to meet the inclusion criteria in our study, they should be classified by Amazon in the health and fitness category. We initially collected about 1,600 skills that were classified under the health and fitness category. 742 skills received at least one reviews from the re users. We filtered down to 130 skills that received at least 11 reviews, which was the average number of total reviews the skills received. From 130 selected skills, 19 skills received higher star rating score than average, and 21 skills received lower star rating score than average. From the remaining 40 skills, we identified 20 randomly selected skills with average star rating score. This process resulted in the final list of 60 skills, and they include yoga instruction, home exercise, health education, meditation tracker, daily health tips, medication guidance, sleep assistance, and stress management. From each skill, six to eight top reviews were included for the final analysis. With selected reviews, we conducted open coding, Excel coding, and thematic analysis to identify emerging themes. During the thematic analysis, we focused on severe aspects of the data, including impact of the skills on their everyday health routines, barriers and facilitators for using the skills, and walk around for using the skills effectively. The thematic analysis showed three main findings. Next, I'm going to introduce the thematic analysis findings of the reviews. First, in addition to the default function that Alexa provides when users purchase the device, the company offers an additional skills to be used. 
activating the additional skills is an extra step for the users. So users would generally need some motivation and expectation for activating the skills. From users' perspectives, one of the main evaluation criteria was perceptions toward the content providers. The term content providers refer to people who guide exercise or provide information for users through voice in the skills. Reviewers mentioned how they were satisfied with the knowledge level of the content providers and how these experiences increased trust towards the content provider and reinforced continued use of the skills. The skills were intended to deliver knowledge such as information about nutrition. Reviewers perceived the knowledge, knowledgeability of the skill as critical review criteria. In the case of the skill that aimed to enhance users' health behavior or promote internal growth, having content providers who share their personal experiences and attitude was perceived as beneficial. The skill developer's history and reputation in the field was another motivation to activate the skill. Also, personal motivation for improving health led them to activate the skills. The reviewers talked about wanting to improve health-related routines and daily habits such as water intake, like improving sleep patterns that are critical for establishing healthy lifestyle. Second, the skills have to overcome the time and spatial limitations for reviewers in carrying out a healthy daily routines. In our study, more than half of 60 skills provided a convenient way to obtain health-related goals quickly and effortlessly. These skills allowed the reviewers to exercise despite their time constraints. They helped reviewers use a short amount of time efficiently without going to the gym. For example, reviewers perform simple workout session using a 15-minute exercise skill whenever they needed to during the middle of the day. Also, the skills not only assisted the reviewers in using time efficiently, but also helped them to be relaxed and being mindful. Because skills provide users with podcasts like small talks, spa music playlists, meditation, yoga, and workout, reviewers showed, shared how the skills they reviewed were used for improving their mental awareness by maintaining stress level. Lastly, reviewers evaluated how usable and useful the skills were depending on their ex experiences now versus their initial expectations when choosing to activate the skill. For example, reviewers commented that the skill they used provi provided limited information unlike their initial expectations. As a result, some reviewers did not want to continue using the skills. When reviewers perceived unmet expectations, they experienced frustration and it lowered user satisfactions. Next, many reviewers expressed frustrations about limited information provided by the agents and skill developers. Reviewers shared shortcomings of voice-based comments. They included the lack of visual cues and unintuitive forms of comment face phrases. For example, a majority of reviewers had a hard time remembering the comments. They suggest the addition, like adding the available comments or advanced function that could be navigated by the users. In case when users are beginners in particular context, it worsens the situation as they are not familiar with the important terms. Also, how voice characteristics such as speed and timing affected perceived usability of the agent. Reviewers emphasized the importance of skills estimating an, an appropriate time that it will take users to complete the task, especially those that require step-by-step -step sequential instructions. For example, if there were too many pauses between instruction in exercise skills, reviewers lost focus with the exercise. In terms of voice characteristics, if the voice features including speed, clarity, and tone did not fit with the skill content, reviewers found it undesirable, particularly for skills that are designed to help users' relaxation, sleep aid, yoga skills. They should consider the importance of the voice characteristics. Reviewers also showed desire to connect the skills with peripheral devices to use the skills functions better. They include Bluetooth-based scales, speakers, smartphones, or tablets. The last barriers of using the agent was method of commercializations. 
Reviewers expressed that including commercial features within the skills increased negative perceptions. Example included advertisement being inserted into skills and charging additional fees for advanced function along the way. However, when reviewers had already established trust toward the content provider, the advertisement could result in a product purchase. In summary, our findings show that the skills enable people to overcome logistical barriers to improving daily health and wellness routines. Also, the role of trustworthy content provider is critical during the adoption. The findings reveal the importance of transparency in the limitation of the skills, and how to better design command and timing of the dialogue is important. Based on these findings, I will discuss implications for designing conversational agents that support health and wellness. First, framing conversational agents as reliable, personified experts is effective in designing everyday health agent. According to our findings, the skills were often used as a source to find quick and easy health information, such as information on pregnancy, nutrition, recipe, or weight management. In our study, the reviewers remembered and called the skills by content provider's name and followed them as a trustworthy mentors. The skills were no longer perceived as an artificial intelligence machine or a system, whether it functioned as a road to encourage connection with the content provider and to obtain reliable information from them. If the skills were intended to deliver knowledge such as information about meditation or nutrition, reviewers perceived trust reviewers perceived trust of the skills was a critical piece of criteria for its review. Sharing the content provider's personal experiences, such as anecdotes about their family, relevant to the skill purpose, further increased perceived satisfaction and effectiveness of the skills. For example, for agents delivering daily tips for expecting parents, agents could represent content providers or represent themselves as those who have raised young children as a peer mentors and they can share numerous anecdotes or recommendations on how to navigate new life situations with new parents. This will foster a more authentic experiences with the agent than those that simply deliver knowledge on what it means to be a good parent. Health awareness skills will often require users to follow agent step-by-step -step instructions such as yoga, physical exercise, or healthy recipes. In our study, 20 of the 60 skills were skills that prompt users to follow instructions. Accordingly, designing the timing and speed of these health-related instructions and users' response to them will be crucial. Studies show that when reviewers met delays before Alexa played the next content, reviewers had a hard time focusing on the task because they lost their pace. On the other hand, when skills advanced to the next step faster than reviewers' pace, Reviewers felt rushed and lost motivation to follow the remaining content. It is critical to accommodate the varied face of users in these targeted activities. Prior literature showed that like strategic feedback with sound effects such as narration and background music for encouraging participants in group exercises. While users conduct target activities alone at home, agents could apply these strategies and motivate them not to lose their face activities. Even though agents cannot precisely calculate each user's face, this effect would mitigate individual differences and be effective in reducing user frustrations. As our study results showed, designing conversational agents for health and wellness involves coordinating multiple components, including source reliability, personification of agent, and voice characteristics. Based on findings, we present design heuristics for conversational agent. These heuristics built on our findings and Nielsen's usability heuristics. We formalized these 11 heuristics for conversational agent called the design heuristics of conversational agent that future developments can adopt and use to evaluate the usability of the agent. 
Are we highlight severe point here, but further details, please refer our conference proceedings. For example, aesthetic and minimalist design refer to the principles that provided content should be simple, minimal, and easily integrated at any time of the day as habitual health behaviors. This was reviewers' primary motivations for using the health and wellness skills in our study. In terms of the seventh heuristic, recognition rather than recall, because reviewers expressed the difficulties of memorizing comments, providing available options for comments as shortcut or comments on a visual interface will help. As health and wellness reporting agent opening verb health information and useful wellness tips, providing ways to check recruited health information would be useful. For example, users should be able to either see or hear a list of medications recruited for that day. In terms of tense heuristics, trustful source of the content. Well designed content providers serve as an effective peer mentor in health context, such as weight management, in a long term perspective. Knowledge of content and expertise should be carefully designed and presented using trustworthy sources, particularly for agent delivering health and wellness content. Our findings brought implications for design heuristics and recommendation for conversation agents that support health and wellness and beyond. Because we use publicly available user reviews, there are severe limitations, including those related to self-reported data. We hope that future studies will investigate heuristics based on real use cases and behaviors. Given the increasing interest on designing conversational agents, our study contributes to improving usability and user satisfaction of the agent for everyday health management. Thank you. Hello and welcome. My name is Temi Lulua Parilo. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Dartmouth College. Today I will present to you our paper, Adherence to Personal Health Devices, a case study in diabetes management. This work has been presented at Pervasive Health 2020, and it's also a part of the Augmented Health Lab at Dartmouth College. So this work is motivated by the prevalence of per personal health devices in our society today. More specifically in this work, we focus on wearable medical devices as opposed to consumer devices. Such personal health devices enable pervasive monitoring of health and vital signs in everyday settings. However, the benefit of these devices is often directly related to the frequency of use, meaning as users use these devices, they tend to have or achieve better management, Whenever they don't use the devices or when adherence is poor, they tend to achieve not the greatest management. So adherence is critical. However, it is understudied specifically in wearable medical devices. In this work on the right, we show some examples of wearable medical devices. More specifically in this work, we're gonna focus on CGMs, which are continuous glucose monitors used in diabetes management. This work has two primary objectives. One is to assess factors that affect adherence or wearing behavior of personal health devices. More specifically, we focus on the diabetes context and investigate whether and to what extent achieving target glycemic goals affect wearing behavior of CGMs. So to further study this, we leverage two data sets. These are two data sets that are part of our lab, the Augmented Health Lab at Dartmouth College, collected from patients with diabetes. These two data sets include a total of 44 subjects. Data set one on average has 60 days of CGM data from 10 subjects, persons with diabetes, and it's shown on the top right. Meanwhile, data set two includes 100 to 270 days of CGM data from 34 subjects, patients, persons with diabetes. As you can see on the right, uh, it shows the five different categories, blood glucose categories that are particularly important and relevant 
for assessing diabetes management. In the green is the normal blood glucose category or range, which is between 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. For a person with diabetes, their goal is to try to maintain their blood glucose within this normal or healthy range. However, as you can see, sometimes the blood glucose tends to go high, very high, low, or even very low. These are considered the abnormal or the the unhealthy categories of blood glucose. So for someone with diabetes, your goal is to try to minimize the time spent in the not normal ranges and maximize the time spent in the normal ranges. You can also see that there are some subjects, for example, subject four, that are considered well controlled, meaning they spend majority of the time in the normal or healthy blood glucose range. Meanwhile, for example, subject six would be considered poorly controlled because they have spent majority of the time in the high or very high blood glucose range. Specific to CGM, um, and adherence to CGM, we consider what is known as wear time, which equates to or equals the number of hours per day that a personal health device is worn. In this study, data gaps or missing data is used as a proxy for finding CGM wear time. So the figure on the bottom shows an example of one week of CGM data from one of the subjects in our study. As you can see, every day of the week is um, shown on the line graph or the time series graph by a different color. And then marked in the red are periods of missing data or what is known as data gaps. You can see that there are some periods that are longer, there are some periods that are a little shorter. There are also some periods where the blood glucose seems to be high when the data gap starts, and then the blood glucose is closer to the normal range when the data gap ends. So the last sample of blood glucose, uh, the last blood glucose sample is used to classify or categorize the data gaps. So for example, B would be, um, the segment annotated in B, the data gap started, started in a high blood glucose category. So keeping this in mind, we also evaluated the distribution of blood glucose values and existing data gaps in the four data sets. We observed that majority of the data was in the normal blood glucose category or the healthy blood glucose category. This equated to about 66% of the BG values that we had in our data set. However, as you can see, there are samples that are in the high and very high and also in the very low and low categories. These are uh, periods of hypoglycemia and hyper hyperglycemia. So in this work, we actually focus on these periods and trying to understand data gaps that are associated with such periods. Looking into the duration of data gaps, just an observation observation of the data sets, we observed that the length of missing data or data gaps range from 15 minutes to 17 minutes. However, we also observed that the longest data gaps occurred in the most severe blood glucose categories. So when the users were furthest away from their target goal. So for example, as you can see in this uh, plot here, whenever the users were in the low, the very low blood glucose category, you tend to have, or we observed, the highest average duration of data gaps in the very low and also in the low category. Meanwhile, on this side, you also see in the high and very high categories, we tend to see the highest duration of data gaps. So this was particularly intriguing and it led us to asking the question, are users potentially taking off their CGMs when in suboptimal blood glucose ranges or categories. To try to better, better study that or better look into that question, we looked into statistical testing and more specifically using a two sample t-test to further compare the average duration of data gaps in different blood glucose categories. More specifically, we use the normal category as reference 
And I want to draw your attention to when we compare the duration of data gaps in very low and very high versus the normal category. As you can see, we found a significant difference between the average duration of data gaps in very low or the extreme blood glucose categories compared to the normal blood glucose categories. This observation, um, this observation leads to or informs that dura the duration of non-adherence is significantly associated with the severity of suboptimal management. So in more severe or extreme blood glucose categories, we, we tend to see longer durations of data gaps. Meanwhile, in normal categories, we tend to see shorter durations of data gaps. However, looking at this at a subject level, that was a general observation. At a subject level, you notice and we observed that this um, phenomenon is not particularly generalizable across all subjects. For example, as you can see on the right, some subjects like subject three and five, this observation seemed to hold true, meaning they had longer durations of data gaps in the abnormal blood glucose categories significantly longer than they did in the normal category. And same for subject five. Meanwhile, for example, for some subjects like subject one, there was no significant difference between the durations of data gaps when they were in the normal blood glucose category versus when they were in the abnormal. So of course this leads to the finding, but also emphasizes the idea that this finding is personalized. It doesn't apply to all subjects, but it was present and observed in some particular subjects, and it was statistically significant. Moving on to group level analysis, we also evaluated or separated the subjects into subgroups. One subgroup was well controlled versus poorly controlled. And this is based on, or this categorization was based on the average blood glucose, which the threshold used for this is hemoglobin A1C, which is a clinical biomarker for diabetes, where a hemoglobin A1C of seven is considered the threshold between well controlled versus poorly controlled diabetes. So this uh, hemoglobin, of hemoglobin A1C of 7 equates to an average blood glucose of 157 milligrams per deciliter. Similarly, we separated subjects into older versus younger, just using the mean, uh, the median, I'm sorry, age, and then also considered just the differences between each of these subgroups. I want to draw your attention to the glycemic target using the hemoglobin A1C of 7%. And we see that there was a statistically significant difference between subjects. More specifically, subjects with poorly controlled diabetes had significantly worse adherence to their CGMs than subjects with well-controlled diabetes. So these are some observational findings that we found in this study or we identified in this study. So just to re reiterate some of the key findings, we observed that suboptimal blood glucose values is one factor, certainly not the main factor, but, certain, but one factor that is significantly affected, associated with wearing behavior. We also observed that longer data gap durations or periods of missing data is significantly associated with extreme blood glucose categories. I want to note that this is an association and not a causal relationship, as was found in this study. However, this introduces a critical dilemma because personal health devices are designed and intended for monitoring health status to inform treatment. However, if users are not wearing these devices when achieving suboptimal health outcomes, that defeats the purpose and it actually also biases the data that is present in such devices. So with that, looking forward to some recommendations from this study, the recommendation is that particular attention should be paid to adherence to personal health devices, especially prescription personal health devices. In addition, data-driven analysis can provide insights surrounding patterns of non-adherence and support targeted, targeted interventions that improve health outcomes. 
as wearable personal health devices become a reality in other domains outside of diabetes, data-driven adherence analysis should be included in embedded algorithms. So with that, I say thank you for listening. And for more details on this paper, please feel free to reference the full paper, which is cited here. And also, you can contact me directly. My name is Tim Delua Priolo. My email address is stated here and also my personal website. You're also welcome to look into the Augmented Health Lab at Dartmouth College. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for your time. Hello everyone, thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Yu Chi. I'm from University of Pittsburgh. My co-authors are Dr. Da Qinghe, Fang Hui Xiao, and Ning Zhou from University of Pittsburgh. I'm very happy to meet you virtually and present this work titled Connections and Disconnections Between Online Health Information Seeking and Offline Consequences. This study is actually part of a larger research project whose broader goal is to understand what, how, and how well health consumers can search and learn in online health information seeking. This project adopted mixed methods, including a controlled user study and an interview to collect the data with regards to health consumers' perspectives and behaviors in the context of online health information seeking. To give you a background of this study, I will briefly introduce what methods we have adopted to collect data and the work we have completed so far. In the user study, we recruited 24 college students and asked them to search for two pre-designed tasks. Search logs were recorded and the questionnaire data was collected. We have analyzed a part of the user study data and published an earlier work which examined the participants' self-selection behaviors in completing different pre-designed online health information seeking tasks. As a contrast, this study focuses on the interview that was conducted after each search session. In the interview, 24 interview participants were recruited from University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University. Before signing up the participants, we first exclude applicants from health or medical related major because we expect to recruit lay people who don't have much health related knowledge. Second, to make sure each participant could share at least one real health information seeking experience with us, we then filtered out the applicants who didn't conduct any health related search within the last six months. As a result, 24 college students were recruited. In the interview, a semi-structured protocol was used to guide the conversation, and each interview lasted approximately 30 minutes. This interview data is used for this current study, and it helps us to understand the connections and disconnections between online health information seeking and offline consequences. Next, I will use a scenario to explain what I mean by online health information seeking and offline consequences, and the specific objectives of this study. Let's assume there is a health consumer. She has a health information need and decides to go online to search for it. In the online health information seeking process, she assesses online sources by her own criteria and selects sources accordingly. At a certain point, her online health information seeking is stopped, and it leads to offline consequence. For example, she decides to see a doctor. This oversimplified scenario illustrates the process we focuses in this study, and it also highlights three objectives of this work which are health consumers' perspectives, consumers' self-selection criteria and actual selections, and the trans transitions between online and offline. So the first objective of this work is to elicit inputs directly from health consumers. Following the consumer-centered paradigm, 
we expected to use qualitative methods to invite general health consumers to talk about their own perspectives towards online health information seeking. Secondly, we aim to gain a deeper understanding of consumers' thought process and the corresponding behaviors regarding thought selection. This is because previous work found that consumers' self-reported thought selection criteria are not always consistent with their true selection. For example, a consumer claimed that they only select health information from authorized sources, but in the same study, they were found to select commercial sources and they even rarely check the source of the information. We believe that examining the similarity and the discrepancy between consumers' thought and behavior provides implications to online health information source. Thirdly, we intend to characterize consumers' own health information seeking story and focus on a less examined topic, the transitions between online health information seeking and the subsequent offline actions. Here comes the research questions. Our first research question is that whether consumers' self-reported thought selection criteria is a true reflection of their practical selection behaviors. Secondly, what are consumers' online health information seeking behaviors and what are the corresponding offline consequences? And why do certain online and offline transitions happen? The interviews were guided by a semi-structured interview protocol. The protocol mainly consists of two sections. In the first section, the participants were asked to express their perspectives on online health information seeking, centering around the question, how do you decide whether or not to select an online health information source and why? Secondly, we ask the participants to share a most recent or most impressive real health information seeking incident. To unfold the consumer's own health information seeking incident, we adopted the critical incident technique and designed a list of questions. Using the critical incident technique, we got the details about consumers' true thought selection behaviors and the whole health information seeking process, including the follow-up offline decisions and emotions. And the conversation was loosely led by this list of questions. Next, I will introduce the data analysis and highlight some of our key findings. We first look at consumers' self-selection criteria what are consumers' self-reported self-selection criteria? In total, 56 comments were collected for this question, and they were summarized into 10 criteria, which further fall into four overarching categories. Provider-related, design-related, content-related, and preference-related. The number of co-occurrences is also reported to suggest the popularity and the priority of them in participant selection. The message we want to highlight here is that consumers' preferences for the provider-related criteria, especially the top-level domain URL, for example, .edu or .gov, were usually less discussed in previous work, while this study highlights the importance of them. We then extracted the mentions of thought selection criteria in participants' real search incidents and compared it with self-reported thought selection criteria in general perspectives. This comparison helps to answer the research question whether consumers' self-reported thought selection criteria is a true reflection of their practical selection behaviors. One new criteria pops up in the real search incidents, which is include personal experience. For example, participant 20 said that, I think YouTube videos are also really helpful because I feel like just because there is an actual person talking, I feel like I can trust him more. 
However, this criteria was not mentioned in the consumer's general perspectives towards online health information-seeking sources. So we learned that some source selection criteria, especially the provider-related criteria, had high mentions in general perspectives, but was only recalled a few times in the real search incidents. We admit that the current data might not sufficient enough to conclude a significant inconsistency, but it deserves further study to look into the source selection criteria and their real usage. Given this discrepancy, we identify the design opportunities that will potentially help the consumers in recognizing the provider-related characteristics in source selection. For example, highlight provider-related source criteria, uh, characteristics to consumers, like mark top-level URL domains in the search result snippet representations, or highlight provider information in the web page. These design features may help the consumers to recognize the provider-related uh, source characteristics in their assessment. Next, I will present the results of analyzing participants' own search incidents. What are consumers' online health information-seeking behaviors, and what are the corresponding offline consequences? Four important aspects are used to de describe a health information seeking process, which are information needs, search starting points, emotion changes, and the decision making. And uh, we believe the information needs and the search starting points belongs to the online health information seeking behaviors, while emotion changes and the decision makings are the corresponding offline consequences. Between the beginning and the outcome, we believe that the source selection criteria presented in the last few slides can help to characterize the process. Therefore, this section will focus on the results of the four aspects and the transitions between them. And as a result, 24 valid incidents were collected from the participants' real search experiences, and they are visualized with this sunky diagram. A set of subcategories is generated for each aspect, and the width of these flow branches is proportional to the number of incidents. Next, I will explain this diagram. First, for the information needs, we identified four information needs. And we found that online health information seeking is frequently used as a tool for self-diagnose. It usually comes together with high uncertainty. For example, if consumer encounter an unsure symptom, or unsure condition, they were very likely to go online to search for it. Other than the self-diagnose, other information needs that may trigger online health information seekings are to learn about a health issue, to relieve a condition, or to pursue better health condition. Second, we identified the two search starting points from participants' real information incident, search incidents. And the participants mainly rely on search engines to initiate online health information seeking. It requires the capability of issuing accurate query and selecting among the search results. And very rarely, the participants will go directly to a familiar online source. Then for the emotion change, we identify the five different types of emotion chains offline. And uh, generally, online health information seeking helps to relieve negative feelings because we found most uh, 
11 participants fell from negative to positive after their online search. And we summarized the six types of decision makings. And uh, note that the continued negative emotion is likely to push the participants to see a doctor, but in some extreme situations, it would stop the online health, health information seeking forever because two participants said that they will never go online to search for health information seeking because they kept feeling negative uh, throughout the whole online health, health information seeking process. Other than that, this decision, other decision makings after online search are following the online instructions, uh, making no decisions, decide to see a doctor, decide not to see a doctor, or reject the online instructions. The main message we want to say is that the, major, the majority of participants felt better and positive after their online health information seeking. And here we give some examples. Participants 19 and 23 who go online to do self-diagnose feel from negative to positive. And uh, participants 5 and 11 who go online search to relieve a condition also felt from negative to positive after their online search. However, this also raises new concerns. The first concern is that most participants follow the online instructions, like in this example. P, uh, participant 5 and 11 decide to follow the online instructions after their search. And another concern is that consumers may decide not to see a doctor after their online self-diagnose because they believe their symptoms or their conditions is very common or is mild according to the information they found online. So given these findings, we think there is a demanding need to instruct and educate the consumers on how to conduct online health information seeking more properly and more accurately. Finally, uh, I will show our conclusions. I want to note that we expect this paper to be a starting point for designing interactions to encourage desirable online and offline actions. For example, promoting of seeking health care if people have health problems, relieving the searchers who feel uneasy for their health conditions. And this study highlights the question that, from an HCI perspective, how to design a better search engine and online health information seeking source to provoke preferable offline emotions and decisions. The first main contribution of this study is that we elicited the characteristics of the health consumers' preferred sources and compared with consumer selection in real practice. Then we explored the health consumers' online search and offline behaviors, characterizing the diverse process with four aspects, information needs, search starting points, emotion changes, and decision making. However, there are several limitations of this work. Using convenient sampling, the generalizability of the results to general health consumer populations other than the recruited college students is limited. Also, using CIT, the data were collected based on participants' recall, which was not validated or directly observed by researchers. That's all of our presentation. My co-authors and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you. My name is Katie Seek and I'm from Indiana University. And today I'm going to present what to expect when you are no longer expecting information needs of women who experience miscarriage. 
This is work that I collaborated on with my colleagues, Cassie Kresny and Lucia Aguero Reyes from Indiana University, and Mona Ahasin and Maria Walters from the University of Edinburgh. And before we go any further, we want to provide a warning that in this talk, we will be discussing miscarriage and infant loss. Miscarriage is when someone experiences a pregnancy loss before 20 to 23 weeks in gestation. We know that one in five pregnant people will miscarry, so it is a common occurrence. In terms of how we as a pervasive health community have investigated, we haven't done too much. There's been a lot of work in supporting the fertility to parent continuum. So we've done a lot of self-monitoring, especially menstrual tracking where, and, and fertility tracking where we know it's complex. There's a lot of pressure sensed by people and there's an emotional burden to it. The other piece that Epstein et al. in these pictures showed that there's this kind of sense of that participants or people or users want pink and flowery types of interfaces and that the context is important. People who are tracking them for menstruation don't necessarily aren't there for the goal of conception. We also know that there's been a, the information search is integral to pregnancy and women's health. Borne et al. has shown that even our web searches can kind of indicate our progress through this continuum. And then we also know that, it, that parenthood is complicated with lots of black boxes to navigate the health information processes to get care. And then there's been lots of work on social support because we know that this changes through pregnancy and new parenthood. So for example, Prabhakar in their study did these circle diagrams for women looked at who was in their social network with them in the center and before they were pregnant and then after when they were a new parent and we saw the changes there. One thing that keeps coming up is that technology plays a key role in facilitating types of, certain types of support for, for new parents. In terms of supporting miscarriage, we know that the, there's been work for internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy programs to help with coping with a miscarriage as her, Kirsten did. And we know that when people don't receive the information they need from their doctors, they often turn to, to online forums, which, which, bets, um, which bets researched here. And then Anda Levy and Forte showed us how an individual's motiv motivation to disclose their experience, especially surrounding miscarriage, was very much dependent on how one's network and observations of other people disclosing. We know from this past work that women seek information based on their individualized experiences, but it's a very manual process. You have to go out there, get the information, or find it within your network. What we want to see and to help with the pervasive health community is just to understand if, if we can identify the time scale of miscarriage journey, provide some contextual clues, and the information systems preferred so that we can provide personalized based information based on one's experiences. For our work we're reporting here, we use the asynchronous remote communities method or the ARF method created by McLeod. We know that there are lots of people all over the world with similar experiences. And we know that they often go to online forums to, to find support and information. And so they may, not even, they may be on various forums or different groups to connect with each other. So with the ARC method, what we do is we create a private group or private forum within a social media platform, and then we engage participants with questions and activities. And so for our ARC study, it was eight weeks and we had 42 participants. We broke it up into two ARC groups. Um, we had, we had partic 21 participants who had not had a live birth since their last miscarriage and 21 participants who had had a live birth before their last miscarriage. Now, our, uh, I have our demographics table here with more detail, but overall, most, we mostly had participants who were white women who were in their 30 to 40s, and they had at least an undergraduate or sometimes even a postgraduate education. We know participants regularly logged on to Facebook, but their usage varied greatly. We had 16 activities over the eight weeks. Most of our activities were free text activities. As an example here, we posted about our Dear Abby. With the free text activities, it gave participants the ability 
to kind of share their thoughts, reply to each other, and like and um, interact with each other a little bit more. We also have two media type activities. So for example, one of them that we'll be referring on here is a timeline where we ask participants to draw out a timeline, take a picture and post it, and then people could interact with it. Now we categorize it as a media slash free text activity because some participants chose to just write out their time, timeline instead of make it visual. And then we had six surveys during this eight week period. Similarly, the past ARC studies, participants responded well to the, to the surveys. We see in this table here, where on, on our x-axis, we have the activities, and our y-axis, we have the percentage of participation combined with the two ARC groups. And surveys here are, are always, are always had at least 70% participation. But also we see there's a slight drop the purple indicates the free text activities. So over time, there's a slight drop in the free text activities. And we only had two media studies, so it's kind of difficult to, to kind of determine what was going on with participation here. For this paper, we analyzed data from six activities, the timeline activity, a Dear Abby activity, and my miscarriage. These three activities allowed us to triangulate, even though they're media and free text, we can look at the participants answers to these so they can talk about their own miscarriage versus the timeline so we can get more richer detail here. We also looked at missing information, important information that they wanted to receive, and technology use. With these activities, we were able to develop a physical and emotional timeline and the resources of our participants. But for time's sake, for this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the physical and emotional timeline. We had oh, over 50 timelines submitted by participants. So we have some examples here for you to see of, of the kind of varying detail that's pro provided here. We can see that they, some participants remembered, remembered the dates around, around the, the activity and others were more attractive, just the month. And then we, something also noting is that they often added in details, not prompted by us, but added in details about spotting versus bleeding versus gushing. This was all based on the participant's own choice of words. So experiences may vary. From these timeline and, and the activities data, we created this abstracted timeline. So the first thing we did was we looked at the participants' experiences and abstracted it here in, in a, in a Sankey diagram. Then we, looked, then we created an abstracted timeline based on their other com comments and quotes that they created in our quality of analysis. And then we kind of talk about the resource needs that they need to out this abstracted timeline. In terms of pregnancy acknowledgement, most of our participants talked about this over half, and there was some excitement. There was, they usually talked to their partner even if they weren't necessarily excited about the pregnancy, they usually disclose to a very small sub, subset of, of trusted partners. And then we have the early pregnancy, pregnancy stage. This is where participants either found out they were pregnant through testing at home, or they went to the doctor and, and found out if they were pregnant. One of the things that we see here too is this uncertainty in that they would maybe go, they maybe get an ultrasound, there may be a heartbeat, there may not be a heartbeat, but un until the, the healthcare community really knows what's going on, maybe it's a bit too early to see a heartbeat, maybe they aren't really six weeks pregnant, you see a cycle of more appointments before they can actually confirm if a, miscar a miscarriage is occurring. So in this preg early pregnancy stage, what we would encourage the research community to do is consider the context of one's pregnancy. So here are some quotes we have from participants. On the left side, we have our excited quotes. They're excited, they're giving their daughter a promoted to big sister shirt, they're thinking about how their life will change. Some of them are excited and just feel like, you know what, that last miscarriage I had, that was already a bad experience, and now we're having something better. Whereas other participants, they didn't want to have the baby. There was these, these intense feelings of anxiety or depression, or they were just 
really anxious and hard to muster and excited because they've already gone through that miscarriage experience. And what we need to do in our designs of these systems when we're providing information is to make sure we understand what, how are they feeling beforehand to understand what kind of resources they may need later. Then we talk about this trigger event. Now, with the trigger event, this is where they know something's not right. Even with the no heartbeat, there's always, participants talk about this hope that maybe there'll be a heartbeat eventually. Maybe in the next appointment, it'll happen. And so with, with these trigger events, what we know is that we can use these trigger events as signals for resources in terms of the systems and the apps that we design. So for this quote here, you know, the participant saying that, that um, I remember not really knowing what to do. It was painful physically. And the doctor prepared them for the painful part. However, she bled so much she was scared. And this happened, this was discussed over and over, especially with, with, with the bleeding and being scared. And so on the bottom here, when we look at our timelines, we can kind of get a better understanding of when these kind of when these trigger events are starting. So on our x-axis, we have length of pregnancy. Zero is the time that pregnancy is actually confirmed based on their timeline. And then on the y-axis, we have those trigger events. And again, spotting and bleeding is based on the participants' own categorization of it. But we can kind of see that once we see those events happening, we, we can maybe look at other, we can either collect better data or we can also think about what else we can provide participants to kind of set them up for understanding what may happen next. And then after the miscarriage, there's a medical decision and grieving. In the paper, we also talk about the recovery, but today we're just gonna be talking about the stages of the miscarriage journey. And so when we are going through that grieving process, one opportunity for pervasive health is to look at how we can connect people with empathetic professionals or a larger network. And so when we look at the information needs in this chart here, we have the information needs on our y-axis, and on the x-axis, we have the number, of, um, the number of responses, and then we also see in green essential to know. A lot of the essential to know were detecting the miscarriage, the medical options, because a lot of times, especially if people found out there was no heartbeat and, um, and, they, and they knew how far along they were, in those situations, participants were asked to make decisions about their pregnancy in this raw state, knowing that they just lost their pregnancy. They're asked about what the options they should do. Should they do surgery? Do they want to take a pill? Do they want to go home and enter to this course? And so that was one of the major questions and the duration of bleeding and when to try again. And so these both kind of representatives said they wanted to receive more support from hospital staff and they just felt brushed off. There were some participants who did have good experiences, but I think helping connect people with empathetic professionals would help and research has shown it will help if they have a follow-up appointment with a professional to help them overcome um, their miscarriage experiences. And then in terms of the, the mental stream here, we, we need to kind of help guide them to resources. And so we know that there's participants who are interested in the mental impact, the next steps. They wanted to, to talk to someone and to have support groups. And often people found them on their own. So in these quotes here, you know, I saw counseling myself, but it would have been helpful, uh, useful to receive guidance as to where to find this. And information about support groups would have been beneficial. Then I found my own through an online forum. Something concrete would have helped. So we need to have better mechanisms to help participants find these resources. And so how are we to support those who are no longer expecting? We want to design systems that consider the context of one's pregnancy. We want to collect and analyze trigger events to provide resources. This is just from 50 timelines. We need a lot more data to to understand it better. And we have to decide when we want to collect that data because participants are under tremendous strain when they're going through the miscarriage. And we want to connect people with empathetic professionals or groups. So thank you for listening to our presentation and we would be happy to talk to you more.